Yeah, I think perhaps we should just uh, start since, uh, you know, my part is five, ten minutes anyway. Sure. But then people would have trickled in. Sure. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome, uh, Tess, Dr. Nadir, Cynthia, Nick. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, the rest of our journalist friends will be coming in uh, as they come in. So uh, I'm the warm up act, the five, 10 minutes before the, the main offering. So I'm Danny, I'm from Kini Academy. Um, uh, I'm the CEO. Uh, we are, we are the, uh, a part of the Malaysia Kini group. Can you move the slide please, Adip? Yeah, so Kini Academy is part of the Malaysia Kini group. Yeah, we are the training arm. Uh, but we obviously then one of our offering is uh, journalism training in which we spend uh, a fair bit of our attention on investigative journalism and uh, we also uh, administer small grants for uh, journalism who wants to uh, journalists or like-minded individuals who want to uh, investigate some stories and pursue some stories we have uh, we have uh, many funders who are very kindly um, uh, worked with us to uh, to to allow these grants to happen we're also working on uh, collaborating with uh, ASEAN partners yeah to get the conversation going among ASEAN newsrooms right and this is one of our efforts the C4 so C4 is uh, supported by IWPR Institute of War and Peace Reporting they're based out of London um, uh, and uh, they, they, they're actually an American outfit and uh, the office that we work with is actually based out of uh, Washington DC and uh, Manila. All right. So uh, they have they support uh, local reporters, citizen journalists, civil society activists in various countries in conflict, crisis, and transition. So uh, let's move on. We thank you very much for uh, for the support. So C4 as a project, yeah. C4 stands for Southeast Asia Forum for Reporting. So uh, it's very uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite driven by and focused on um, the reporting function. So uh, journalists uh, are a focus. So um, uh, the journalists of ASEAN apparently do not collaborate enough. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I have uh, many reasons for that, uh, that I hear, you know, language and uh, it being one of them. So uh, this effort aims to uh, bring journalists together with two overlaps, so to speak. So one of the overlap is all the journalists uh, who are in the project tend to be reporting from the same desks. Therefore, they have a lot more in common with uh, the other journalists in different countries. And uh, the other overlap will be the subject matter. So uh, we ASEAN related topics obviously then becomes uh, relevant to all the ASEAN journalists who are reporting in this desk. And that's the two overlaps that we are, we are banking on that we hope to uh, have a journalist start conversation with each other, okay? And uh, so this is supposed to be sustained uh, going ahead. So C4 has got a few uh, few components. Uh, one of the components is masterclass. Uh, this masterclass now we have five series. Frankly, we do aim to have a, a few more. Um, um, we're working on that. And uh, masterclasses are basically on ASEAN topics. Today being one of them, uh, I'll, I'll share a bit more after this. The second part will be reporting, uh, not yet, I think. The second part will be re the reporting project. So each one of the publications in ASEAN that's partnered in our in this project, I will actually be uh, pursuing a story project. Okay, and uh, there's, uh, there's the third component is the conversation, right? So we look to start conversations across ASEAN. So there's a WhatsApp group with journalists from all over ASEAN uh, newsrooms who are in there. And uh, that's uh, where we actively encourage conversation. So thanks, next please. So as you can see, uh, our four superstars who are at hand today to share with us their perspectives on uh, corruption. Uh, Tess is whom we're depending on to uh, drive the conversation forwards and keep it interesting. Um, uh, Dr. Toplas or Nick uh, from Thailand, Chula Longkorn University, uh, Cynthia Gabriel from C4 from Malaysia, and Dr. Nadir and uh, from University of Monash in Indonesia. So as you can see, we try to uh, we we bring we are trying to bring um, ASEAN voices to the fore to have them contribute their perspective to this conversation. 
yeah, to move the ASEAN agenda uh, uh, forwards. Next, please. Next, please. So um, uh, some of you who know already, uh, who's attended before, let's try to put your, uh, um, your mics on mute, mute and have your name uh, with your organization in your profile name so that we know where you're from. Okay, just add it like uh, how I put my uh, Kinder Academy after my name. All right, uh, we do encourage you to leave your, your video on uh, but more importantly, this is the time to ask your questions. Yeah, to, uh, if, we, if, if it's not for your stories, it's to enrich your knowledge and to keep the conversation going. All right. And of course, I think you guys, as you're signing, you know that the session is being recorded. Okay. Uh, this recording will be made available. Uh, C4.org is our website where we house the previous, the recording from previous masterclasses. The slides are available as well, and the transcripts will also will also be made available uh, after a few days uh, when we worked out the kinks. All right, so uh, it's c4.org. Our previous masterclasses are all up there. Um, uh, all the uh, all the profile of our speakers are there as well for journalists attending this uh, masterclass. This are uh, your new sources, your new expert that you can talk to, and today is your opportunity. All right. Let's go to the next slide. So um, uh, I think, uh, do we have the pre-poll results already, Adip? Or should we move yes, on? Yes, yes, we do. We do. OK, great. Wow, great. Thank you for uh, the seven responses. Um, when we ask uh, how often journalists cover issues relating to corruption, um, you know, almost uh, 70, 80% of you say a lot or sometimes. It is a rather big issue in our individual countries, isn't it? Uh, nice move. How familiar are you with the academic approach to analyzing corruption? So similarly, we have at least 70, 80% who are not so familiar at one and two. So I guess uh, Nick has, or Dr. Toplas has got a section that I was looking forward to, and that probably shines some light on this. Let's go. How important is the issue of corruption in your country? So uh, yeah, it looks pretty clear that uh, we are we are we all we most of us think is pretty important. In your country, which area of life is most affected by corruption? Civil service rank uh, right on top, and the next chunk would be politics, economy, economy, social st structures, and legal system. Hmm. Yeah. To what degree does your country collaborate with other Southeast Asian countries to combat corruption? Uh, we're right in the middle right here. And uh, this is actually one per perspective that I would love to hear a bit more from the speakers. I know individual countries are already battling, uh, have a big, big ass war to, to, to fight. You know, how does we, how do we, how do we collaborate across the borders to to help reduce this. Next, please. So um, uh, good, we have more participants in already. Uh, let me introduce Tess, who's going to help us with uh, with uh, with the session. So Tess, uh, she is currently the project lead and editor in chief of the Asia Democracy Chronicles, a region wide initiative uh, spearheaded by the Asia Democracy Network. She is an award winning journalist editor media consultant. She's based in the Philippines. Uh, she's written on issues ranging from uh, public governance, corruption in government uh, to women, children and migrant labor. She's uh, also edited books and other publications for institutions, including John Wiley, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, and the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. So uh, Tess, you take over. Thank you, Danny. Hi, everyone. Thank you to, um, for this opportunity to be with you today in this important discussion around corruption in Southeast Asia. So my main task is to the, do the opening presentation on corruption in our region. So let me screen share now my presentation. Uh, okay. 
Uh oh. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm having a bit of. I tried it earlier. Sorry. Let's just wait a bit. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, why don't I? Okay, I'll, I'll just try and I don't know what went wrong. I tested it earlier and it was working, but let me just, uh, anyway. Um, I'll just. Yes, if you it. click on share screen, does it yeah. show different windows? Uh, I did, uh, but let me just check. Uh, No, no, okay, no. So, so. All right. So you can, um, Cynthia, what you do is you open the PowerPoint first on your desktop. Test. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, test. It's, it's open. Actually, I don't. <laughs> Wait. Uh... When you say share, uh, they'll, they'll give you an option to pick the window yeah, that I, you want I, to share. I, I got that. Um, wait, let me just see. Are you using the Google Slides? I'm using Keynote. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you just email the slides to us and one of us can share oh, it? It's, it's oh, there yeah. now. Okay, yeah. there it is. Yeah, I don't know what that. You gotta click the present view. Yeah. Okay. Great. Sorry about that. Okay, I um so I titled it "Understanding Corruption in Southeast Asia: A Journalist's Lens." So, just a bit of disclaimer: I don't claim to be an expert on the extent and the, you know, how the the, the issue of corruption plays out in the whole of Southeast Asia. But from what I have seen, and as an investigative journalist, um, and also in my former role as regional editor for some media publications in Asia, I think I've seen enough of how corruption plays out in the region. But I'll be drawing on my experience as a former investigative journalist with the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism or PCIJ in, in the Philippines. Um, yeah, okay. Um, let's, let me provide a bit of a backdrop to uh, what I what, one of the things I wish to highlight in my short presentation. Um, the Bureau of Internal Revenue in the Philippines, which is the, or the BIR, it, the, it's the top tax collecting arm or the main tax collecting arm of, uh, of the Philippine government is one of the most corrupt agencies in, in the country. So many years ago, uh, up until I released my series of reports, it, it was a three-part series on the BIR. There were, there were a lot of rumors circulating about, circulating around the, the um, extravagant lifestyles of many tax revenue officials. And I thought it was high time we did the report about this issue, mainly to shed some light on what's really going on in the region and why the BIR, the Bureau of Internal Revenue was considered one of the most corrupt. Actually, one, uh, 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 it's one of, uh, one of the most corrupt agencies in the Philippines, one of which the other being the Bureau of Customs. Okay. So the, my report, um, the three-part series was titled um, Bureau Officials, BIR Officials Amass Unexplained Wealth. Um, it, was, um, it took me at least six months to do the research. Um, and and uh, I had with me a team of researchers who helped me obtain, the, obtain some of the well, voluminous documents I needed to be able to uh, determine the unexplained wealth of the, the, well, the alleged unexplained wealth of many BIR officials. So I looked into the houses, expensive, the fleet of expensive vehicles, business interests of at least uh, 25 BIR officials and employees. Um, in the Philippines, civil servants earn a modest income relative to compared to the private sector they earn significantly less so it's always a red flag when a public official or a public employee is you know 
is known to have expensive vehicles, for example, or a uh, a um, a or a, a, a big house in some posh subdivision or village in the Philippines. So I looked into this, um, and then um, yeah. So what came out was that many of the officials I investigated even after I obtained their statement of assets, for example, could not explain adequately how they acquired their assets, including shares in businesses and, and companies. And we, uh, we found out also that BIR postings are so lucrative that many of them would petition a change in their birth records if only to delay their retirement, which meant the longer you stayed in the bureau, you know, the more opportunity to generate unexplained wealth. So that's is that's essentially what happened. So in 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 in, in this three part report, I wanted to show also the I mean to lend credence to the allegations of unexplained wealth, but at the same time explain to the reading public how systemic corruption within the bureau um, was. Uh, I mean, became possible. What were the breakdowns, for example, in the systems of checks and balances that made corruption in the Bureau? So the three-part series that I wrote for PCIJ concluded uh, by looking at the breakdown in the systems of checks and balances in the BIR, the lack of transparency, the lack of oversight and accountability, all of which contributed to making the Bureau one of the most corrupt government agencies in the Philippines. Now, I highlighted some phrases here, systems of checks and balances, lack of transparency, because these were reflective of, the, of how corruption essentially was taking place in the Philippines. In other government institutions, there were also similar, um, similar flaws, the absence of... Uh, checks and balances, or even if they were in place, they were not really being um, implemented. The lack of transparency is not unique to the BIR, but also applies to other government agencies in the Philippines. Um, I, for example, I later on, I looked into the local city, local government units, for example, in one of the biggest cities in, in the Philippines, or one of the well, actually one of the wealthiest in terms of revenue being regenerated by businesses. Uh, but I found out similar flaws, the lack of transparency, the lack of oversight, the lack of accountability. Um, I would say that what I saw in the BIR when I did this story, again, this is not unique to the Bureau, this is not unique to the Philippines, but well, elsewhere in, in Southeast Asia, there are similar challenges uh, taking place, the absence of ch checks and balances, the lack of transparency, the lack of oversight and accountability. Among the most form common forms of corruption in the Philippines that I think also applies elsewhere in Southeast Asia are bribery and facilitation payments, fraud, favoritism, and undue influence, nepotism, extortion, conflict of interest, to name a few. Um, even these days, we see these kinds of corruption taking place. Uh, for example, fraud um, has been um, leveled against one, the Department of Health in the procurement of medical supplies for uh, frontline health workers. Now. Um, Moving into Southeast Asia, I mean, looking more broadly at the region, it's interesting that not, notwithstanding the massive spread of corruption in our region, there are supposedly systems that are in place. There are anti-corruption agencies, for example, across the region. You have this in Cambodia. There's one in Indonesia. There's another in Malaysia, the Malaysia Anti-Corruption Commission, even Myanmar. The Philippines, on top of other government units, has the Presidential Anti-Corruption Commission. Singapore has the Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau. Thailand has the National Counter-Corruption Commission. And even Vietnam, um, the Steering Committee for Anti-Corruption. I tried and checked Lao, but I couldn't find any similar institutions. Um, now, similar to the Philippines, um, I think this is a fitting met metaphor at the time when we're dealing with uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Chronic dis corruption is a chronic disease with deep roots. For example, one study showed that as far back as the early 2000s, three of the countries in Southeast Asia, uh, the Philippines being one of them, 
So the others being Indonesia and Thailand ranked among the most corrupt countries in the world based on several um, indices. And this had, at the time, this had been going on for the last three or four decades. So I thought that was, um, I thought that was, that, that, that's very interesting. And even when you look at the, at, I mean, what was taking place during the period 80s and 90s when the democracies were supposedly robust in the region, um, there were, and you know, uh, there were expectations that given the, the, given the state of democracy at that time, there should have been a significant drop in corruption. But what they found out was contrary to what was, um, to what was expected. Um, one study noted, for example, that notwithstanding the economic liberalization that was experienced many years back, like in terms of the reduction of trade and investment barriers, the, the reduced government intervention in the economy, um, there were expectations of reduced corruption because then businesses no longer needed to pay bribes to be allowed to operate. Yet despite this, there has been no, there was, at the time, there was no discernible fall in, in corruption. So really corruption in Southeast Asia has been going on for, for decades. Now, um, more recently, uh, going by one of, the, one of the studies that came out, uh, this is a survey. According to the UNDP, three out of four millennials in Asia, including our region, of course, believe corruption and poor governance are holding their countries back from social, political, and economic progress, meaning corruption has its adverse impacts, as we all know. Within our region, uh, about eight in 10 of business leaders recognize corruption as a major challenge for their business operations. Now, this particular finding takes on greater significance. Um, at this time, for example, when, the, when you know, there's massive unemployment because business companies have shut down and you know, if there's corruption and they're not able to operate as they should, then it also impacts their ability to hire more people. So it's really like a domino effect. Now, in terms of public procurement in Southeast Asia, similar to what I found out when I did non, another series of studies looking at, into the state of procurement at the, at the local government unit level, Southeast Asia is one of the worst performers when it comes to publishing, relevant public procurement documents uh, in terms of procurement plans, tender documents, award notice on government websites. In the Philippines, we have a law on procurement that mandates government agencies to practice transparency, like in the conduct of bids, for example, but still procurement is a major problem. As I mentioned earlier, the procurement of medical supplies amid the pandemic is a major scandal now in the Philippines. The, the Senate, for example, has just concluded its investigation and is, I think it's, it has already released a report. And, um, and, the, and the public has been enraged you know, by this kind of situation because our health workers, for example, have been clamoring for increased salaries for the release of their promised benefits that to this day has not been given. So, um, so really, uh, this is the extent of corruption we're seeing in specific parts of, of our region. Now, in terms of the freedom of information laws, how many countries in, a in Southeast Asia have the FOI law? Uh, I know that Thailand has, the Philippines still ha has none. Even if for three decades, the FOI bill has been pending in Congress. And this is very valuable because it allows the media, for example, to access important documents. Um, so these are some indications of corruption in the region. Now, if we would recall some of the biggest corruption scandals that have, uh, that have uh, rocked our region in Malaysia prior to the IMDB fiasco, there was the Port Klang scandal, for example, um, in Indonesia on the electronic ID system, the EKTP scheme. We remember this story by Cambodia Daily, which was shut down, I think in 2018, still taking a cut involving the, the military. Now in the Philippines, um, during the administration of President Joseph Estrada, there were one of the scandals that hit his administration was, you know, the 
the the string of uh, uh, expensive of, or mansions that he had for his mistresses that the PCIJ exposed through its series of reports and that helped lead to the uh, the um, fall of uh, of President Estrada. Um, now, it, it's not surprising to see this kind of uh, numbers by the Transparency International, the Corruption Perception Index in Southeast Asia for 2020, which was released earlier this year, of the 10 countries in the ASEAN regional bloc, only Singapore is listed among the clean countries with 85 out of an index score of 100. Malaysia is performing relatively better, but all the rest, Timor-Leste, all the way down to Cambodia, which is the most, uh, which is the highest uh, corruption, uh, uh, I mean, the, the poorest ranking. Um, everybody else except for Singapore is performing very poorly in terms of perceptions of the incidence of corruption uh, in these specific parts of the region. Now, if we look at the, 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 the state of democracy in different parts of the region based on the Freedom House report, its latest 2021 showed that only uh, four countries are partly free. Only one is free, Timor-Leste, and the rest are not free, namely Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. Now, what does this say in terms of, you know, how, I mean, in terms of the state of governance um, in, in, in the region? Um, now, it's, I, it, it would be interesting to see the correlation, of course, between the, the state of democracy and the extent of corruption, whether it's correlation or causation, for example, in, in, uh, in the Southeast Asian region. But it's, it's hard to tackle corruption without looking at the state at the same time at the state of governance and the state of democracy or what's left of it in, uh, in, in our region. Um, it's very interesting, for example, that my own country, the Philippines, had the people power revolution that toppled democracy and that raised a lot of expectations in terms of better governance, a, a cleaner government, for example. But where are we today? You know, we're still one of the most corrupt countries, not just in Asia, but in the world. So I think this, the same can be said of other parts of the region, including, including Indonesia. Um, now, if you talk about turning the tide of, of, of corruption in the region, of course, there have been efforts to curb corruption, particularly by civil society. Laws have been passed to address corruption. But of course, um, well, as some, you know, as we would sometimes say, these are more honored in the bridge rather than uh, in the in the observance. So the 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 the, the the widespread corruption in the region does not mean that there are no systems in place to, to curb corruption, but how are they being implemented, for example? Uh, it's interesting that one author writing for the UNDP site said, standalone solutions do not work. We need to effectively address the multifaceted nature of corruption through systemic solutions that involve multiple actors. And this brings me back to what I, what I was pointing out earlier, working as an investigative journalist and being conscious of the extent of corruption in the Philippines. I was mindful of not just exposing the corrupt officials, but also helping the public to understand where the flaws were, why corruption is you know, is, is taking place in the first place and why there's been a lot of difficulty in trying to stop corruption um, in, in my country. And this brings me to, I'd like to share a bit about the, the value of investigative um, journalism. Um, maybe um, true enough, um, standalone solutions, according to this um, author, for example, would not be enough. But how about one investigative story at the time? Um, it's interesting to note that our stories, especially in-depth investigative type, help raise the level of discourse, understanding among the public uh, in terms of the incidence of corruption. 
Why is there so much corruption in the procurement system, for example, in the, you know, in how environmental regulations are being implemented? Um, the public needs to understand this. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in the role of a journalist in elevating the level of discourse around such important issues. Well, but we're aw well aware that in the past several years, the state of repression in Southeast Asia has been intensifying. And we're seeing that even in the midst of the pandemic, as, as has often been said, been written about, the pandemic has been used as a pretext to clamp down on civil liberties, on fundamental rights. And this includes you know, press freedom, the ability of the media to expose and really generate thorough understanding of what's going on and hold our public officials to account. Um, but interestingly enough, the more repressive our environment is, the more there's a need for these kinds of issues to be brought to the fore, to be, to be, um, to be explained in a way that the public will understand. Um, of course, there are challenges, especially these days, in doing, you know, in 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 bringing to light the specific uh, uh, incidents of corruption in our respective countries. Uh, you know, there have been uh, there have been severe um, uh, consequences for journalists looking into specific issues, such as this story, for example, would show. We remember the two Myanmar journalists from Reuters. Uh, we know, of course, what happened to Maria Ressa, who's uh, news publication, the online uh, news site Rappler has exposed uh, a number of uh, situations relating to governance in the Philippines, in particular the so-called uh, uh, drug war of President Duterte resulting in her being charged, for example, with uh, being slapped with not just one, but several libel cases. Uh, this is part of a series on impunity in the Philippines in relation to the drug campaign of the anti-drug campaign of Duterte. Some people need killing, people dying left and right in the course of the so-called war on drugs. So there are really, you know, severe consequences. But the more the government, I would say, as a former investigative journalist, and now as a journalist, of course, the more crackdown, uh, the more intensifying the crackdown is, I think the more people need to understand what's going on. Um, even during the pandemic, we're seeing a sharp decline in, in, in fundamental freedoms, including press freedom. Um, um, you know, the, the, there, are, um, there are many important issues that need to be brought to light. But journalists are being hampered from, from, from doing that. Um, but it's interesting to note that in Southeast Asia, we have a strong investigative reporting tradition, at least in some parts. We've seen the setting up of, invest, of investigative journalism centers. Indonesia has, for example, has the uh, has Jaring, Myanmar. I don't know if this, is, uh, if this is still operational. I checked their Facebook page. The last post was in 2019. But the Philippine Center, but PCIJ is still very active. There's the Thailand Information Center for Civil Rights and Investigative Journalism and other media outlets in our region really doing commendable work in terms of exposing corruption. There's Frontier Myanmar, New Narrative, Malaysia Kini, of course, the independent outlet, the alternative outlet, Prachutai, of course, Rappler, the Defang Cambodia Daily, to name a few. Um, I think this, uh, this reflects on the 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 courage of journalists in the region to really uh, not just do the usual reporting but really produce more um, in-depth and in investigative pieces for the public to be aware of what's going on um, very quickly not all reporting is investigative reporting of course some are, some is merely merely reactive. I think when it comes to corruption, it's very important that there are more efforts being exerted toward investigative reporting to bring what is otherwise hidden from public view to light. Um, and this brings me to one thing that I want to highlight because of the repressive environment in which many journalists in the region are operating that makes it difficult for them to put out very important reports. I think this is time 
this, it's high time that we had more collaborative efforts, especially along the lines of investigative journalism. Uh, in Indonesia, there's been considerable efforts, particularly by Tempo, for example. Even Thailand, there's been a push by some investigative journalists toward cross-border collaboration. Um, Pandora Paper, which uh, exposed uh, our own leaders in the region, including those, the very influential ones within the region, you know, uh, in terms of their uh, um, um, investments or financial holdings outside of their respective countries is an example of collaborative effort. Now, I want to highlight that um, the when it comes to exposing corruption and getting the, under, the public to understand the... Uh, how corruption is taking place, why it matters to them, why solving it may not immediately bring food to their table. Um, I think it's uh, the, the role of investigative journalism is not just in terms of raising awareness, getting people to be informed, but it's really to engage people in the business of public governance and where needed to enrage people because this corruption in the region is not something to, to take lightly or to take sitting down. Uh, this very interesting statement by Sheila Coronel, one of the founders of PCAJ and who's now with, uh, uh, with Columbia University School of Journalism. Uh, this is a lot, this holds a lot of relevance for our work as journalists and in particular for investigative journalists. Democracy is not a spectator sport. It requires the active participation of citizens in the business of governance by informing, educating, and mobilizing the public. And I think stories that expose corruption, that explain to the public how corruption, take pla corruption takes place, achieves this. It informs them, it educates them, and it mobilizes people to, to action. So, um, so overall, I would say that um, corruption is... Um, as, as much as it's a big challenge for us, it also presents opportunities, especially for more collaborative efforts in the area of investigative journalism. It's something that we need to be taking a closer look at in terms of what kinds of stories can we put out and the public needs to understand, especially at a time when, when we're bombarded with a lot of disinformation. And I end on that note. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if there's any, are we? I'm just looking at whether what, there's any question or reaction, some Im immediate reaction so, from the participants so, uh, and move to our speakers. So Tess, there are two questions in the chat. Perhaps you could address those two and then we'll move on to the rest of the session. Uh, okay, I'm looking at the... Would you mind just reading them out? Sorry, Ajib. Sure, yeah. no problem. Yeah. Um, so the first question, uh, you talked about elevating the level of discourse on corruption. As a journalist, is it important to avoid sensationalism in the discourse on corruption? Okay, this is where the value of IJ or investigative journalism comes in because you cannot resort to sen sensationalism when you, do, you follow the paper trail the people trail, you do field work and observation. There's no way you can sensationalize because everything is backed up by data and fact. In my case, when I did the number of reports I, I did for, I wrote for PCIJ, I spent a lot of time obtaining documents because I could not rely on mere, uh, the mere say so of my sources, even if I found them credible. There's no way you can sensationalize when you do, you do uh, adequate, Paper trail, I mean, getting as much documents as you need to be able to verify what is otherwise is just allegation, for example. Um, and this is also where we earn more credibility from the public, because when the public sees that what we claim in our stories is backed up by data, backed up by investigation, backed up by documents that is uh, that otherwise are available to them, then we, you know, the public would be able to see that, you know, these are not just allegations, these are, these are not just claims, but really 
verifiable information in terms of what this public official, for example, or this public institute um, uh, is doing, like in terms of the allocation of public funds, for example. Yeah. I hope I address that. Sure. Um, in the next, the next question, what do you feel is the greatest challenge for Southeast Asian journalists in covering corruption? Do journalists in other countries experience the same issues? And I guess what's meant here is um, basically, what are the unique challenges in Southeast Asia that you won't find in let's say covering corruption in a Western country? Um, well, in terms of the extent of repression, uh, um, the challenges are greater relative to other countries that don't experience the same level of repression. For example, when, when the simple act of trying to obtain documents, you, you encounter restrictions from the government, it makes it more difficult for you to do your investigative report because otherwise, you know, without those supporting documents, there's no way you can come up with really a credible, a credible report. Um, other challenges would be resources. It takes resources to do investigative work. If news outfits are not willing to invest in investigative reports, there's no way you can come up with one. And at this time, especially during this time of pandemic, news organizations are either, shut, are either shutting down or have significantly cut back on their operations, which affects the volume of stories that they're able to put out. So those are two challenges that I'm seeing. Um, um, and of course, the, the political will of organizations, um, of media organizations uh, in the Philippines, not just Rappler, but even some of the biggest newspaper, Philippine Daily Inquirer, have received direct threats from President Duterte. And this, you know, and this intimidates them in coming up with, with scathing reports on what's really going on. So I, would, I wouldn't say that the challenges are unique to Southeast Asia, but they're more pronounced in our region than elsewhere. Right. Yeah. We have another question coming in, just one more. Are there any ASEAN media support organizations that journalists can be a part of to collaborate on cross-border stories? Um, I can't, off the top of my head, I can't think of any at, at, at this moment, but I would say that the opportunities are there for us to come together, even if we don't have an organ, we're not organized as groups. Right. Because for example, and we're trying, we're hoping to do that at Asia Democracy Chronicles on similar themes, for example, somebody in India doing a story on press freedom, another in, for example, in, uh, in, in Malaysia, for instance, and then you bring these stories together. For, I mean, that could be as simple as that. And you have a cross-border story, mainly to provide a broader picture of what's going on and to prove, to show to the public that this situation is now regional in scope and this is not just country specific. So um, at individual levels, I think journalists can come together, agree on doing stories, but I think some organizations are more open to being tapped for potential collaborative pieces because issues now are cross-border. And it doesn't make sense to just confine our stories to our geographical borders because, and I think it makes it, there's a practical side to it also, what you cannot publish in your country, you can get it published elsewhere. And, you know, uh, because then you don't need, you don't have to fear being a charge or slapped with cyber libel, for instance. Uh, so, I mean, those are some practical, <laughs> practical things that could be considered at the very least. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, I'm quite optimistic about the prospects for collaboration because I see that there are more and more efforts in that regard. And journalists, including as part of my experience as editor-in-chief of uh, Asia Democracy Chronicles, are now more open to collaboration. Yeah. We have another question that's just come in, but I think uh, we're almost out of time. Tess, did you want to address one more question or would you like to move on to... Uh, Dr. Toplis's presentation. Uh, to be fair to Dr. Nick, maybe we could reserve this for later if that's sure. okay. Sure, no yeah, problem. We have our panel yeah. discussion later. So should I proceed and introduce Dr. Nick? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. 
So, so, so now, thanks, thanks for the questions. Um, so may I introduce our first speaker, Dr. Tor plus Nick Yomnak. He's assistant professor uh, at the Faculty of Economics in Chulalongkorn University and director of the Center of Political Economic Studies. He's also co-founder and chief advisor, hand, all caps, Social Enterprise Executive Board Member, uh, Anti-Corruption Organization. Um, just very quickly on um, Dr. Nick. Um, um, he he co-founded CM Lab to study corruption from multidisciplinary approaches, which is very relevant, I think, to what he's going to discuss with us today, uh, meaning economics, legal, political science, education, etc. Findings from the research are then implemented by hand. Maybe you can tell us more about hand, what it does. So Dr. Nick uh, will um, provide us an academic lens, I think, to the issue of corruption and uh, I'm personally looking forward to hearing what he has to share. So, Dr. Nick? Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Tess, for just, uh, just such a kind introduction. Um, and uh, thank you for the, such an insight, insightful presentation. I'll be um, uh, touching on several points that you made earlier. Uh, for example, corruption in procurement, why data is not well disclosed, um, that happens in Thailand as well, despite the fact that you mentioned that we have the FOI law, um, somehow it was <laughs> it's not quite well enforced. Um, the impact of corruption is so devastated, and, and uh, which show, showed in the fact that our CTI or corruption perception index uh, is so high if we don't uh, consider Singapore <laughs> into our formula here. But so, so that's basically what I will be discussing today. Um, but I need to uh, disclose this first that I am I'm, I'm sure that the least or at least at least less experienced than most of the people in this in this room regarding uh, journalism, and um, so I won't be able to address the fact how how the, the process of how we can uh, get information or how to write uh, uh, news uh, article well, um, but but I'm sure that. A few few of the questions that we have been facing, which is um, is this corruption? How do we, do we define corruption? Uh, is this a good? Is this policy uh, anti-corruption measure good policy that we should praise? Should we should support, or is this something that we should argue against? Or what? What? How should we address these things when when we hear it? Or how should we write it in the news? So that is kind of like what I will be presenting today within this thirty minutes presentation. So please allow me to share the screen. Um, okay, I'll click present. All right, can you see my screen? All right. Okay, thank you very much. So again, thank you for the kind introduction that this, this is me. Um, and the prop and the first thing that I would like to mention is that the, I just mentioned earlier, um, we have been facing these problems a lot, these questions a lot. And, and, and the answer is that there is no definite definition for corruption. Uh, um, from the views, viewpoint of pol political science, they talk about the use of public power for private gain. Um, from the viewpoint of economists, they say that it's a transgression of uh, formal rules governing the allocation of public resources. So, so that's the main point, the allocation of resources. So it means that um, when it derived into the activities that you have observed uh, to, to write into news or from you receive from your witness, um, it could range from just direct bribery to extortion, to fraud, to speed money and to embezzlement. So this is just to show that there is no definite answer. It can, corruption can be very narrow. It can be paying money to the police officers or it can be very broad. Uh, appointing your own children into public office as your secretary or something like that. So it's, 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 it can be debatable. But when you want to address this as a corruption issue, these issues can be addressed and be defined as a, in, in, under a, a big umbrella of the definition of corruption. So don't worry too much about the definition. We're, academics still argue on, on this issue. 
But I would like to take you back a little bit uh, to see how, how we approach, we as an academic approach the issue of corruption since, well, not the beginning per se, but, but like from 30, 40 years ago. So when we first talk about corruption, that is around uh, 1960, 1970s, at that time people were, the, because before that people, academic were still debating whether corruption greases the wheel, making like speed money, making things go faster, or does it sands the wheel, making things go slower? Um, and at, at the end of the era, uh, the academic kind of agrees as a consensus that corruption uh, sands the wheel rather than greases the wheel, making um, red tape uh, more strict, making uh, bureaucrats and politicians be able to uh, uh, ask for more or get more money from, from the citizens. So in the year around, once this was a consensus around 1970s, um, academic view corruption, academic and, and, and pu the public, and of course the media as well, view corruption as associated with power. So many states and government use political science approach to design their anti-corruption policies. And by that, it means when we use the approach of um, political science, we, we look at corruption as, the, as caused by the power imbalance. So power imbalance by state and society, like an efficient check and balance system, as a consequence, state can take advantage of the society. So what is the solution for that? A stable and good quality democracy is the key of people to be in the hands of the people, creating power balance and good governance with efficient check and balance system. So it's like, like that straightforward. What's the problem? Some countries has been able to successfully curb corruption using democracy, but somehow in, in many countries, in, uh, for example, in Thailand as well, we have had um, democracy for the last 80 or 90 years, but somehow we're still facing high level of corruption as Tess has shown earlier. And I'm sure this happened with many countries as well. So the question of how, whether corruption, whether democracy kill corruption has been debatable in, in, in academic as well. Um, but this has been kind of solved and, and announced by the Transparency International who developed the uh, uh, Corruption Perception Index. They recently included the variety of democracy project uh, in, into the calculation of Corruption Perception Index very recently. Um, so it shows that yes, democracy is very important. But this is a very, um, well, not quite, uh, not, not quite the latest, but a but, uh, very interesting finding from Stefan Dotter in two, year 2011. It shows that, well, maybe it's yes and no. Um, theoretically, the theoretical relationship between corruption and democracy show, uh, up, uh, uh, show an um, upside down U curve, meaning that at, at the earlier stage of democracy, corruption, it can provoke and allow corruption to to increase, and then once we reach the threshold, uh, corruption can de decrease with democracy. I mean, by, by by having more higher democracy. So why it's such um, a crazy idea how democracy, which is supposed to be the the ultimate solution to fight corruption, can um, promote corruption in a certain period of time. So in 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 this. In this particular paper, he suggested that because at the earlier stage of corruption, check and balance system has just been established. For example, these anti-corruption agencies, which Tess has again kindly uh, shown us, had just been established. So power from one people has now spread to the hands of many, but not as many in the earlier stage, not in the hand of the people, but on the hand of a few bureaucrats on the hand of a few politicians with weak check and balance system. So it kind of like be able to increase the level of corruption. And once this institution is strengthened, once the power is allocated to the hand of the people, then that's the threshold that we are looking for and thus allowing corruption to reduce um, when we have such a strong, a demo, so strong, stable and good quality democracy. So, so to, to suggest, to, to talk about this is just to say that yes, democracy is the solution, but democracy is such a complex um, 
uh, system, it's not just having an election, it's, it needs to be a free and fair election as well as um, freedom of speech, freedom of uh, press freedom, uh, so on and so forth. So when we approach corruption and when we approach the topic of democracy, be aware of this as well, you know, that, that it, it's something to, to kind of think about and and the and many one, after this, most of the people ask me, then what is the threshold? And that is the weak weak point of this paper, who which cannot suggest where the threshold can really be should be. Is it the timeline? Is, is it a hundred years or what? Is it what is it? So basically, it's just a theoretical relationship um, between corruption and democracy to 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 well to kind of ad address this issue theoretically. But in practice, yes, of course, as I mentioned earlier, many democratic states somehow were unsuccessful in curbing corruption, maybe because of that uh, up, upside, um, upside down U curve. So around 1990s, once we realized that this is a problem, we kind of like turn away uh, a little bit and look at the, uh, the problem on the legal aspects. Uh, look at it as a problem with the rule of law, um, that there is no e equality before the law, there's no equal justice and requires equal protection, ensuring that no individuals or groups or individuals can be privileged over the other by the law. So yeah, again, legal approach to design and enforce law as the main anti-corruption policy. So when we took legal approach, we, we see that corruption is caused by the inefficiency of law enforcement. And so the solution is to is to establish the rule of law, meaning a clarity, more clarity, more clear and more efficient and effective enforcement of the law, and of course higher participation from the people in designing the law. Once we start believing that the law is the solution, Thailand is one of the very good example. Um, Thailand is one of the very good example of this. So from 1990s to today, we have like, um, uh, uh, is there a question or something or should I continue? Um, no, sorry. For the participants, oh. please mute your mics, please. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this happened to me many times. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. So once we took this, this approach, um, we, were be we were able to have, more of 15 anti-corruption laws and it is increasing. And this is a very high number. Thinking about this, this is just one single social problem. And each law, uh, thinking about each law is like this thick and we have like 15 laws and regulations on fighting corruption alone. And again, one more thing that proved that this might not be the only solution is that if you have heard about this, uh, uh, this po uh, policies or this project before it's called regulatory guillotine. It found that the more laws and regulations we have, the less efficiency we have in our society, the more licenses we have. For example, in Thailand, if you want to uh, establish or register a, a, fa a new factory, you have to go through like tens uh, uh, bureaucratic agencies and you need to secure like 15 licenses or something like that. So having more law, having a higher number of law doesn't solve the problem quite efficiently and effectively. Uh, and on the contrary, reducing the number of laws and regulations has been proven more effective and more efficient in reducing corruption. For example, in here, this case, Korea has used, uh, have over 8,000 laws relating to licensing. So after regulatory guillotine, we need reducing uh, uh, through these process, uh, collection review, stakeholder engagement and, and analysis, public hearing, they were able to reduce 48% of these licenses and saving over 4.4% of their GDP. Sorry, uh, somehow it missed there. And Vietnam as well, for example, Vietnam has 12,000 similar laws and revoke, and to, if we were to revoke over 70% of them would facilitate over a million job creation. And many countries in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN has been able to adopt this project to a certain extent. Thailand has adopted this project in a few years ago, but somehow it ended up with a very big 
reports, the government hasn't been trying to actually enforce or, or reduce the, uh, the number of these laws. So, so just to, again, to wrap up on this approach is that, well, looking at, uh, through looking at the corruption problem through legal lens, legal approach is one solution, but we cannot solve it by having too many laws and increasing uh, the number of laws every year to solve one single problem. So if this is the problem, we, we, uh, democracy is right, uh, is the way, but well, we, we, there's so many things in democracy, it's such a, such a complex, um, uh, we need many, there are many factors in the, uh, establishing stable and good quality democracy. Uh, increasing number of law may not be the solution. So what is the solution? Around year 2000, we were having, we as an academic, we were having this question. So how to approach this? Social science then come into, came into play. They were proposed as, as an alternative solution well, social science, uh, similar to journalism or to a certain extent, find that, well, corruption is caused by personal relationship. Uh, for example, causing fa favoritism leading to special and unfair treatment, which facilitate bribery, so on and so forth. So the solution, there's no specific explicit solution, but rather often more better understanding of the people and the phenomenon. And this is where it benefits um, the journalism directly. Uh, this is from one of the research that I conducted last year with um, uh, uh, social scientists and um, a professor at the marketing department. We would like to know that, well, we have spent tens of thousands of, or if not a hundred of billion baht in campaigning people to fight corruption. And when, when, we're at, when they asked the National Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, who are you? Uh, uh, target group. They say that everyone in the country is their target group. And this uh, confused people in marketing so much because if you say that everyone is your target group, then it means that you must have a billion uh, baht, a billion US dollars in, for, for budget for the campaign, right? Because you cannot sell everything to everyone at, the, at one time. So we conducted this research to really to understand people and how they perceive corruption and the corruption anti-corruption effort eff, uh, dif differently. We were be we were able to separate people into four groups. One uh, on the first group here are the are the group that. Oh, sorry about the tie. Uh, if I didn't I didn't. Um, um, yeah, so the, the first group of the front line here, the group that they are uh, very actively involved with anti-corruption efforts already. And on the fourth group here as the individualist, meaning that they are not, they do not care much about corruption. And we try to understand their behavior, their, um, their uh, what do they like? What do, don't they like? What, um, what kind of message do they like? And we found that if we were to, these two groups may not be our target groups. Because one of them are our loyal customers already. And one of them will need lots of investment in order to pull them into the anti-corruption uh, work with us. So these two, then group two and group three who are in the middle, they might just need a little nudge in order to bring them on into the anti-corruption project, anti-corruption effort. So once we found who our target groups were, we try to see how communication would affect people's behavior differently. So we used a, a behavioral economics experiment, a uh, social experiment to test on, on um, 100,000 people in, in, Thai, in Thailand. And we found that the message with, which uh, has high creativity, less aggressive, explain with uh, kind of like emotion, letting them see the impact of corruption and use less number will be able to pull people, especially these crew groups, into joining our anti-corruption efforts better than using a more aggressive and use higher number. Uh, so, so that's from, from our experiment. Yeah. Another point is we conducted another experiment using a game called Corrupt the Game, which was um, developed by one of our, uh, well, our colleagues. We found that pe pe different type of 
corruption can be solved differently and also with difficult, uh, different difficulty levels. So uh, the methodology is very lengthy, so I won't go much into to that. But we found that people think tend to think that bribery is more obvious than helping your friends um, illegally. Uh, than uh, providing funds to your, some budgets, uh, procurement budgets to your friend. So if we were to approach this and create success story, let's fight bribery first. And then we'll be able, when we have success story, we will be able to tell this story and have, give hope to the people. And then they will follow with, with the following more difficult uh, corruption to uh, uh, problem types, for example. Also, I, I thought that this would be quite interesting for you. Um, under the umbrella of social science, there's this approach uh, called linguistics. Uh, so I work with a professor from the Department of Linguistics, um, and he suggested that, well, language can make people feel differently about corruption as well. So choosing words correctly can help achieving the goal. In one, our first experiment, we separate uh, our, uh, our um, uh, people into two, two control group. One of the group you see here on the left-hand side, we give them a, a piece of paper suggesting a message suggesting that corruption is like devil and the rest is uh, like corruption is how so high, the impact is so high and so, so and so forth. And in the other group, in the other room, we gave, gave them the similar message, but he, the difference is we say that uh, corruption is like disease uh, and we should do this and uh, corruption is so high and so on and so forth, okay? And then we asked them how would they suggest to fight corruption? 80% of people who received the message that corruption is like devils suggested that we should increase punishment. We should kill, uh, execute uh, the corrupt culprits. Well, 80% in this group who received the word that corruption is like disease suggested that we should have better monitoring system, we should have check a higher, better check and balance system. So this happened within 30 seconds with just one different word. What will happen to us who have read newspapers, online news for like 30, 40 years? Uh, how, if we, how, how different uh, wording in different newspaper in different countries affect our behavior? So the second research based on this finding, we went to Indonesia uh, a couple of years ago, met several uh, people at the Jakarta Post, um, and we looked at the wordings of comparing over 300 million words from the two newspaper in two countries. We use English because it's easier to, to do the word mining process. But what we found is that in Bangkok Post in Thailand, we use words that cause drama, meaning that causing people to be very emotional, using death, uh, you know, take away things. While in the in the Jakarta Post, uh, most of the words when we talk when they talk about corruption, they talk about laws and regulation, collaboration, participation, system, media news, and it allows this to happen. Uh, if you, I'm sure uh, uh, that you, you from, from Indonesia can tell me better about this uh, incident uh, that uh, people gather when the KPK uh, budget was cut and people gather to kind of like to protest against the government cutting the budget of the KPK, which is their anti-corruption agencies. This has never happened in Thailand. And Indonesia has like a hundred anti-corruption groups and uh, soci group, uh, civil societies, organizations, formal and both informal and formal. In Thailand, we have 20 to 30 organizations. So, so we try to somehow relate it to these two together to find out that wordings in newspapers, in articles can affect the behavior and how people react to corruption. Furthermore, we were so interested in how media use words in, in, uh, when, we when we compare with corruption. So we would like to know uh, what people be would behave when we compare corruption to a different circumstance. On the left-hand side, uh, again, this is like the first uh, experiment. We separate people into two groups. One group, we gave them a message suggesting that corruption is like um, fire, uh, your house is on fire. Uh, on the second group, we gave a message suggesting that corruption is like uh, you 
um, uh, piloting a ship through storms and your ship is about to be uh, to sunk uh, to sink sorry um, so what do you think who should be responsible uh, for each case apparently again 80 percent answer differently 80 percent in this group suggested that everyone should be able to help in the when, when we say that corruption is like fire your house is on fire because it it kind of gives you the impression that we everyone can help we can have a bucket of water and they throw the water into the fire and it helps but on the right hand side when we say that we it's like a ship going through storms people tend to suggest that that the person who should be responsible is the leader in that country because you kind of like give the responsibility to the pilot of the ship uh, the captain the ship captain so and you kind of like have to sit and pray uh, in hoping that they will be able to take you through the storms uh, so so just a small words like this change people behavior and change how people think okay i started with suggesting that i'm an economist i have like five minutes left so I'll, I'll go through this very quickly um so where 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 has the where have the economics economists been we have always been there but we don't like to talk about corruption that much perhaps because it's uh, too uh, difficult of a problem to approach we rather talk about how to make money um, but there are people who talk about corruption as well for example in the neoclassical economics which we consider as a mainstream economics think that corruption is occurs when benefit outweigh costs so the solution is to increase punishment and detection so based on this idea uh, it is uh, they use the rational choice theory. And for example, if you think about if whether people will, will rob a bank, they will think, uh, yes, I would do it if the money gain is higher than the uh, gun and um, the cost of gun and ammunition and, and criminal uh, plus criminal charges. Or the, for uh, another word, likelihood to gain money is more than the likelihood to be caught. So based on this rational choice theory, uh, Professor Robert Clipgard, um, created this corruption formula. He suggested that discretion plus monopoly uh, minus accountability redu uh, uh, equals to corruption. So basically, if we were to reduce corruption, we should reduce discretion because um, politicians and bureaucrats will, can use their power to do anything. We need to reduce that uh, monopoly. We don't want someone to take control of the power. We need to uh, increase accountability, which include include transparency, accountability, uh, data, openness, as tests again, has already suggested. So you have covered almost everything, Tess. Thank you for that. Um, so I don't have to go through it too much. Um, there are other type, uh, other kinds of economics, other schools of thoughts as well. For example, the political economics, as you see, uh, uh, Karl Marx here has suggested it's an exploitation. Yeah. One class exploit, the capitalists exploit the labor from the labor class. So what we can, what can be so the solution is a people movement and civil society. And this, as I mentioned earlier, this is um, pictures from what, hap what happened in Thailand, which is very uh, little compared to other countries. For example, in Indonesia, um, you should be very proud of yourself. We 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 have we have so much. Uh, lower number of anti-corruption organization in our country. Um, but we have tried, we've been trying to, to create more um, collaboration among people. And these are, for example, some of the organizations. We have um, some new, uh, for example, here is Sarah Institute, which is one of the biggest uh, um, investigative journalism in Thailand. We try to uh, support them with Must Chair and the uh, Watchdog Group, which is a social social media online uh, group, and they work together very well. So this is one of the model that we have that the Yam Lab and Hand Social Enterprise uh, help uh, create it, uh, collaboration amongst um, informal and formal news institution and to uh, to cross the border into the this is to this is the prevention group, for example, the Integrity Pack. Uh, working on creating higher transparency in procurement. And this is uh, the um, cultivation. So uh, curriculum for students and young and, ch and children uh, to teach them about the negative effects of corruption. So when they work together, 
Bissara or the investigative journalism will have more things to write about. And have, they have been able to uh, successfully do that the, in the past years. Um, also, um, one minute left, um, uh, two minutes left, thank you. Uh, there are also other approach, for example, institution economics, we explain that corruption is caused by asymmetric information, meaning that some, the bureaucrats or the politicians have more information than the people or more than the, 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 uh, more than the media. So veteran monitoring system reduce transaction costs, that helps. And this is where the media comes into play because the media be able to be, are able to reduce this uh, asymmetric information problem. Also at the same time, Institutional economics leads to the establishment of these agencies, the KPK, the CPAB, the Malaysian um, uh, Anti-Corruption Commission and the Thailand Anti-Corruption Commission. Um, I would like to end this presentation here with this uh, case studies, which was very recent in Thailand. If you see this, this is a light, uh, light pole, very beautiful, but it's, it's put it's installed into a nowhere land. Uh, no one passes through this. Uh, this single pole, a post, costs around how much? 2,000 pounds. Uh, 1,000 to 3,000 US dollars, for example. Uh, so, so it's something like that. One, one citizen found this. Yeah. If we don't have any uh, in, uh, data available, public data available, or as Tess put it, as procurement data available, we wouldn't be able to do it. And that has been lack in Thailand. We don't know how much this costs. We don't know who is the response for this, the responsible for this, and why are they there? So, Siam Lab and at the Chula Yung University and Han Social Enterprise with the anti corruption, uh, anti -corruption organization Thailand has been able to develop this. Um, we were proud to present this. Um, this is called Act AI. So we uh, spent years gathering 20 million data set from the procurement, um, from the government procurement platform and put into this um, Google-like uh, web page uh, called Act AI. Act is anti-corruption Thailand and AI is like artificial intelligence using artificial intelligence to uh, get all the information and analyze information. And we found this. And we, um, these are the companies who uh, bid for this project, how much they bid for it. And if you can see this, it's very, this is the, the name is this, uh, not disclosed here. Uh, but if you can see this, this is the, from the real case. It's very ast astonishing. Um, so this, this is the reference price. This is how, how much below the reference price, the actual price is. And you can see this, there are five companies bidding for the same project all the four companies bid the same price. One company bid just uh, a thousand baht less than the other four. And so this CCC company won the bid. It is very clear uh, that it has very high risk for collusion and high risk for corruption in this case. So ISRA news agencies and uh, all social media agencies use this case and we were able to stop this project and put um, uh, people behind this project behind bars. So that is one su success story from having less asymmetric from information from the collaboration of data with the uh, civil society and with the investigative journalism. So, so based on these theories, based on these, um, so, sorry. So based on these academic theories on um, how do I stop share? So sorry about, um, based on this theory, we were able to um, establish new projects. We were able to understand corruption differently. We were able to provide suggestions to the media, to the, to the state national anti-corruption commission, to the civil society groups who work on this particular problem. And when we work together using knowledge and research from the academic side. We work together to create um, new possibilities to fight corruption together. So um, I end my presentation here. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Nick. That's very interesting. Um, that's a lot to digest, but very interesting. Uh, I'm sure they have their very practical value to us in the media in terms of how we do our work and you know, as we look into corruption. Uh, very quickly, there's a question here before we go for a break. In, Mal uh, in Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, it was hoped that removing corrupt leaders would eliminate corruption. Does getting rid of a corrupt leader reduce corruption? Or are social factors more important? I think that it helped. Um, obviously, if, if there's, a, as I mentioned earlier in the corruption formula, if we have a monopoly, high in monopoly, in this case, corrupt leaders, um, there's more higher likelihood that there will be more corruption. The pro the, but the problem doesn't stop there. If even we remove the corrupt leaders, but the, system, the check and balance system, as I mentioned earlier, that for example, democracy is not that simple. It requires check and balance system. It requires power to really be on the hand of the people. If we don't have the system in place, it will be likely that there will be new corrupt leaders. Bureaucrats will be able, or bureaucrats and politicians will be, be able to use their discretion uh, to create more corruption. Yeah. So we need to reduce both of them and at the end and, and at the same time increase accountability. But that sounds simple, right? It's not like <laughs> no no it's, I just say that it, it sounds simple, but the it has complex high complexity behind each of the factors. Yeah. In many instances it's just the players that change. <laughs> yes, yes, obviously. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, do we have another, Ajib? Uh, you said there were two, sorry, before we go for a break. Uh, sure, there's one more. Just give me one moment. Okay. You maybe, you maybe you can just read it out, please. Sure, yeah, I can do that. So we have another question on the issue of linguistics. So your section on linguistics and discourse was very interesting. How do Southeast Asian languages, like Thai, for instance, how do they present ideas on corruption. And I guess a good question asking connection to that is this is Southeast Asia, what does Southeast Asian culture say about corruption as well? Well, um, I believe that it has a different kind how you the way you use and the word you use for, for to 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 compare corruption affect our behavior as the, just like in the uh, example I show. But unfortunately we weren't able to um, used like uh, linguistical, uh, com computable linguistics to, com to com calculate uh, words in other language apart from English because it's uh, different language, especially Thai and other languages in, in Southeast Asia are so highly complex. So uh, that's why we use Bangkok Post and Jakarta Post. But based on that rational, based on that rational that even uh, ling English words can, can affect our behavior, I'm sure that um, that words in other language will do have effect on our behavior as well. And, and comparing corruption with um, like, we, we say we eat something, we, we, just, we just eat something. It's, 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 it, it makes corruption less, um, less aggressive, less, less of a devastating uh, effect than using corruption as, a, like, as I mentioned earlier, uh, devil or disease, something like that. Um, this is very interesting. We wish we could extend the discussion. There might be more questions, but we need to go for a break now, right, Ajib? Uh, yes, yes. Could we reduce it to five minutes, or do we still make it ten minutes? We can right? have ten. So we can have ten minutes. That's perfectly okay. fine. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Sure. Okay. So now it's three fifty-seven by my watch. <laughs> so is that correct? Uh, okay. Yep. Let's make it four. So we come back at four ten. Thank you very much, Dr. Thor. We'll uh, we'll try and have more questions maybe later during the panel discussion. But for now, we'll have a ten minute break. Please come back at four ten. Is that okay, Ajib? Yes. So four ten Malaysian time. Yes, and Philippine Malaysian. time. <laughs> and Philippine. That's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. See you later. Thank Please you, come back. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tess. Okay.
Hi, Cynthia. Hi. If you want to just screen share your slides now, just before uh, we, I mean, can I try we'll it now? It, yeah, we'll start in two minutes, but I thought you might want to try. Can it I try it. sharing the screen now? Yeah, we'll I'm just, sure. you can share it and then we'll just leave it on until, until we start. Share it and then? Um, you can screen share it and then uh, once we start, you can just, you already have it prepared. Yeah, okay. I'm going to do that now just in case there's something, something goes wrong. Uh, you see it has disappeared. Mm. Where is it? Not here. Cynthia, sorry. Is it Gabriel? Gabriel, just making sure I pronounce her. <laughs> Where is it? It's suddenly not here anymore. Sorry? Uh, no, 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 I don't know where my PowerPoint disappeared. Uh, do you want me to share the slides for you instead? I can do that. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Where did it go? It was here just a moment ago. I think it's the same thing that happened to me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have one minute, I think. Oh, are we already starting? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> well, we can, you can take your time. Okay. Um, okay. If you press share screen, the yeah, first thing I press will... share screen, but now it's not anywhere there for me to share it's uh all my other stuff are there so it's not is it open is, are your slides open on your computer and i just uh, share it from uh, a minimized version of it a minimized version no okay let me just click this and see does it come out um Maybe try and open it again. That's what happened. That's what you I did. <laughs> yeah. You see? Uh, no, 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 we can't. The do you do you have it open on your laptop? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing is to make sure that it's open on your laptop itself, and then what you do is you screen share after that. How come it disappeared? I can't believe it. Uh, okay. Let me try and open it again. Tess, I believe you asked Cynthia a question. Or... Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I would pronounce her name, surname correct, family name correctly. <laughs> Gabriel, Gabriel. <laughs> Sorry. I think it's Gabriel. Okay. Yeah. okay. You can see? Yeah. Yes, yes, now we can. Great. Okay. So now I'll introduce you. Okay. Uh... Yeah. Would you like to go back to the beginning? Okay. It's clear? Yeah. Is this your is this your opening? Oh is this God. your first I don't know what happened just now? We'll get a lesson from you later anyway. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Hi everyone. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> yeah. So now we move to an, our next session. Uh, now looking at corruption from another lens. Um, we're looking at corruption uh, based on issues of illicit illicit financial flaws political financing and how corruption fuels transnational and cross-border crimes in Southeast Asia. So we're just as privileged to have with us Ms. Cynthia Gabriel, uh, Advocate and Solicitor, UNODC, uh, UN Office on Drugs and Crime Consultant and Civil Society Leader on Governance and Anti-Corruption Issues, as well as Founding Director of the Center to Combat Corruption and Cronyism, or C4. Um, Cynthia, is easily recognized as a key rights advocate in Malaysia. She has spent most of her professional life in the field of advancing and promoting human rights, good governance, and democratic freedoms. She has also worked on UN contractual research work in the area of migrant and refugee, refugee research in their vulnerabilities towards HIV AIDS. Much of her time has been devoted to building and shaping the work of leading human rights advancements in Malaysia and across the globe. Uh, in recognition of this, she was elected vice president of the global advocacy group, the Paris-based International Federation for Human Rights during the period 2004 to 2009. And as I mentioned, she was recently set, uh, has recently set up a policy center the, called the C4, the Center to Combat Corruption and Cronyism. Over to you, Cynthia. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tess. Uh, thank you to Kinney Academy for this invitation and for this most interesting masterclass session, which I believe uh, is very timely also. What I wanted to do, um, also because we've already listened to an expert journalist and uh, an academic that presented very interesting uh, discourses just now. I wanted to do uh, several things. One is to map and identify corruption in Southeast Asia, which means beyond our country borders, but what is it that constitutes uh, regional corruption or cross-border corruption? And what is it that we need to be concerned about uh, as investigative journalists and as investigators in the fight against corruption, in turning the tide against corruption? So we know that Southeast Asia is a very vulnerable region, very dynamic region, and it's one of the fastest growing economies in the world. But we also know that safeguards, uh, institutional structures to look at better accountability and accountable governance is probably one of the weaker regions in the world. So we need to actually look at better investigations, paper trail, evidence-based, and real investigative work. So I'm actually happy to present um, a couple of case studies, which I hope will be um, uh, impetus for many uh, investigative journalists uh, among yourselves to, to start writing and perhaps probe deeper and dig deeper and to see what kind of tools that we have available. So um, what I'd also like to do is to look at the cross-linking factors between business and politics cross-linking factors between transnational crime and how it interfaces with corruption and whether corruption actually fuels and facilitates cross-border crimes, cross-border criminal activities and crimes which are transnational in nature. So um, this is just an overview of uh, geography and a location of Southeast Asia and where we are today and all the different countries and some of the um, maritime borders that also have many issues related to corruption. So um, in moving forward, I think a very important thing that we need to probably situate this discussion is to look at ASEAN itself. Now, if many of us have already been familiar with writing about ASEAN and knowing about its uh, its mode of operations, we could be critical about its, um, its lax ways of moving forward. It's very cautious about not uh, getting into each other's domestic politics. Uh, it's um, a very focused block on uh, regional trade advancement and sometimes other issues like human rights, security issues and all that uh, are many issues that uh, become frustrating as we try to discuss. But having said all that, there's something very important also that we need to recognize that ASEAN has also evolved and grown and known that it has to come together. It has to have its act together if it wants to be um, relevant uh, trading block in the region. So there's an ASEAN charter now and there's three important security uh, pillars, one of which that I want to highlight today is the political security blueprint. And the other one is the ASEAN economic community and then the ASEAN social cultural pillar. And all these three are commitments of ASEAN to actually develop an ASEAN community vision for 2025. So we are in 2021 now, and it looks like there are a few years before us to actually look at how to turn the tide on corruption in Southeast Asia. But as I was digging through, I found something interesting on the ASEAN political security blueprint, which all of our governments had actually signed on. So if you look at A2.3, there are several commitments that our ASEAN governments have made. One of it is to implement the memorandum of understanding that was signed back in 2004. And that is to prevent and combat corruption, to look at the Treaty on Mutual Legal Assistance. This is really important in criminal matters and corruption matters that involve 
more than one country. And uh, we can actually share a lot from the lessons learned from the 1MDB scandal. And we can promote ASEAN cooperation uh, within the UNCAP, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, which all 10 uh, ASEAN member states have actually signed. So this is uh, these are actually uh, tools for us to use in calling out our governments and actually ensuring that some commitments get realized or how we can actually push and mobilize further. Intensify corruption, uh, anti-corruption efforts now uh, as a region. And very interestingly, recently there is a pact formed called the Southeast Asia Parties Against Corruption in which ASEAN member states have actually committed to develop a greater capacity building, training for governments, law enforcement, et cetera, on how to fight corruption, promote the uh, ASEAN integrity dialogue and so on. I'm putting this because I think we also need to remind ourselves that there are documents like this in Southeast Asia among ASEAN countries. And these are probably very important tools for us to um, move forward in how we want to develop better collaboration and investigative journalism as we talk about corruption in Southeast Asia and how we can hold our government to account for all their actions uh, at country level and at the sub-regional level of ASEAN. So here is what I was hoping to do, is to introduce some cross-border issues. Uh, which does not involve just one country. Uh, it involves definitely more than one country and sometimes many other countries in the ASEAN region. So the first picture on the left is probably something that most of our countries suffer from, which is an issue of natural resource governance, an issue of forest governance and illegal logging that quite rampantly takes place. It definitely happens in Indonesia, it definitely happens in Malaysia, uh, in um, uh, the Philippines and many other countries because of our rich tropical forests. The picture below is something that is hotting up now. Um, we are completely uh, overwhelmed, completely inspired by the collaboration and uh, investigative expose of the Panama Papers. Uh, First, that was a couple of years ago, and very recently, just a couple of weeks, the Pandora Papers, which highlights so many Southeast Asian countries, apart from countries in the world, on illicit financial flows, on tax evasion, on how the Uber rich uh, actually evade paying taxes at home, but enrich their wealth through the shadow economy in offshore islands using unscrupulous means like uh, shell companies and various other issues that the Pandora papers had actually helped us digest a bit better and help us realize how it has actually impacted so many of our countries in Southeast Asia. And then of course, the picture on the right is something that we see all the time. It's, um, it's uh, ships of, uh, stateless people, uh, refugees trying to seek refuge in some of our shores. And many Rohingya communities uh, have actually died as a result of all these. Now these are cross country issues, cross border issues, and there are many, many more. But what I wanted to highlight are some of these uh, details and case studies that would actually make very important investigative writing. And it's really all about data, all about trying to digest how much we can analyze around what ASEAN needs to do. Okay. Hello? Yeah, we're all here, Cynthia. Yeah, I don't know what happened. The slide just got jammed. Would you like me to switch over to my slides? Yeah, please, because I'm sure. not sure what happened. It just suddenly got stuck.
Should I stop sharing? Um, no, I'm already. I'm. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? I'm sharing this this one on corruption in Southeast Asia. Okay. The image of the boat. Okay, so I just need to tell you to move to the next slide then. Sure, sure. Okay, can we move? Sorry about that. Not sure what happened. Sorry, but Jim. No worries. So for the next uh, slide. Hello, oh, Cynthia, can you see the screen? Uh, okay, can you see the screen now? Cross-border corruption in ASEAN, is that yes. the... Yes, okay, right. okay, um, right, uh, let me just continue. So this is what I was actually talking about, uh, some of the other examples of transnational crimes fueled by corruption. Uh, the uh, one uh, very important case study that I'd like to highlight is the import of uh, plastic waste. Uh, I've touched a little bit on illegal logging, illicit financial flows. And then we come to a couple more um, rather serious transnational crimes uh, affecting the ASEAN region, like uh, drug trafficking, which is very rampant uh, uh, in Myanmar and how it affects its uh, neighboring countries, for example, Thailand and also Malaysia. Uh, illicit trade. Uh, this is actually very interesting because the illicit trade is actually growing the shadow economy in uh, Southeast Asia. So we talk about illicit trade, we're talking about uh, illicit uh, cigarettes, uh, illicit alcohol, uh, many types of goods that are uh, moving across borders without actually going through the proper channels. And of course, issues of natural resource governance that I talked about. Now on the right-hand side, I wanted to show some of the key characteristics that the uh, ASEAN member states share. And many of us have um, either a current autocratic government or a history with autocratic leadership. And this has actually helped to fuel corrupt practices. Uh, political instability uh, that is currently affecting countries like Malaysia, Thailand, um, and so on. And the pandemic, uh, I think it's very important to note how corruption has actually flourished along with the pandemic. And with that, uh, we also know it's also because of low levels of accountability, a very politicized public sector, and uh, very corrupt law enforcement uh, much of the time. Uh, we have some examples, of course, where this has improved over time, like in the case of Indonesia, but it has also been stopped from being fully independent. But in Malaysia, we have tons of examples of uh, how the law enforcement, including the police and the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, are themselves also uh, saddled with uh, corrupt officials and so on. And another very inter interesting and important issue, which I will highlight in the next slides, is really about uh, political financing and how political financing is creating corruption, not just within countries to win elections, but it is also corrupting the region because of illicit financial flows and uh, suspicious donors uh, from foreign sources to actually fuel um, um, decisions of how elections can be won by different countries and who should win elections, etc. So we have poor whistleblower protection all along and definitely protection for investigative journalists is something that we need to discuss um, uh, as we go along. Okay, now uh, this was earlier shared by uh, Tess on the corruption perception index in the country. Uh, this is just something for us to take note that most of the countries in the ASEAN region fall from uh, 50, number 50 and below. And so that actually speaks very strongly of the need for better collaborative investigative work uh, to connect the dots and mainly to follow the money and to actually see where it actually lands up to track illicit enrichment and so on. Okay. Uh, here are some figures on the impact of corruption on doing business. 
I picked up a couple of details from the World Bank Enterprise Survey uh, carried out in 2019. This was before the pandemic, of course. And it was quite startling, really, to look at the issue of procurement, the issue of public procurement, where 43.5%, according to the World Bank, of businesses, whether they are SMEs or larger business businesses, including multinationals, were actually expected to give gifts to secure government contracts in Southeast Asia. And what was prevalent in the region is also um, prony capitalism, personal connections, and political patronage, which was actually leading how access to government contracts and lucrative economic resources are actually dished out, as opposed to meritorious uh, companies trying to bid for a multi-million dollar contract and so on. So it is all about who you know, rather than what you can do and what kind of experience you bring into the system. So this is a huge problem in many of the Southeast Asian countries. And it is something that needs urgent reform and something which is, I think, structural much more than cultural. Although we can argue that culturally, people feel receiving gifts is just normal because this is how Asians are, you know, you appreciate somebody for doing you a favor, and so you give them a gift. Now, there are big differences between uh, buying flowers than buying uh, an expensive Rolex watch or buying um, edible food as opposed to um, providing uh, golf club memberships and um, houses and land for free and etc. And uh, gift giving has always been a problem in which uh, fuels bribery and corruption. So when is it that you draw the line between what, whether the gift is a bribe and whether the gift is a reward for allowing for licenses, uh, tenders to be given out. It's a huge problem where procurement has actually bled the system of many countries. So with that has also been the uh, evolution of the growth of illicit trade. Uh, I mentioned cigarettes and alcohol just now, but I think uh, there are many, many other uh, contraband items and uh, it gets more serious when we talk about uh, the smuggling of uh, people, the uh, smuggling of drugs, and uh, many issues which link to transnational crime. So with that, uh, I wanted to take us to the next issue. So to think about how corruption actually uh, shackles and jeopardizes uh, doing business in ASEAN. And this might be a very important advocacy approach for us to uh, give real evidence and data to governments when we are advocating for uh, better governance, accountable governance, better democracy with ASEAN governments, that if you don't plug corruption or turn the tide against corruption, businesses would probably uh, leave the region and go invest somewhere where it might be uh, more enabling. So it could actually work in the favor of businesses to support turning the tide against corruption. So here is another example on the import of plastic waste. Uh, this was rather shocking because we discovered that Malaysia was now importing plastic waste for recycling and many other uh, industrial purposes. So the countries that were exporting to Malaysia and to Indonesia and several other countries in the region uh, were Western democracies like the United States, Canada, the European Union, um, shockingly quite ignoring their own uh, domestic policies at home uh, and just exporting waste to uh, less developed countries, all because China in 2018 under the national SWOT policy, started to ban 24 types of solid waste imports, including plastic, paper waste, etc. So what happened was a global disruption for the market for recyclable material, and they redirected plastic waste to Southeast Asia. And suddenly we started to get complaints. The center that I uh, lead 
uh, started to get complaints from residents in small towns like Sungai Petani, uh, Junjarum, Klang, and even in Butterworth that they were becoming victims of uh, illegal factories burning plastics. And it was because of this that we started to launch our own investigation. So the organization that I work with actually does uh, investigative reporting. We are not a journalist organization, but we believe that the only way to call out corruption is to get the facts, to follow the trail, the paper trail, the money, etc. And then it opened a, another Pandora box of worms where we realized that there were some uh, law enforcement agencies. In this case, I think it's very interesting to look at customs and how customs um, was actually a very central agency that needed to answer many questions over how plastic waste was actually brought into the country and why so many um, factories were illegally setting up. So if you look at the picture on the left, uh, this is a in, um, infographics that we created uh, to help Malaysians actually understand why this was becoming a problem. And that we became the top destination in 2018 for plastic waste exports. So 754,000 tons of plastic waste was imported into Malaysia in 2018. By 2019, Malaysian authorities decided then finally to take action after some campaigns and advocacy and people actually banging on the doors of the uh, domestic trade and consumer affairs and also the housing ministry, et cetera, including the environment ministry decided to send back about um, a, a, a few hundred tons of plastic waste back to the uh, uh, sending countries and closed down about 170 illegal recycling factories. So all of this was some um, launched in a report. We put together an investigative report on plastic waste coming from Western countries and infiltrating countries in Southeast Asia because China had suddenly banned uh, the uh, imports of plastic waste into their country. So the impact here is local to global, global to local. And the Southeast Asian region was then filled with rubbish, so to speak. And it was a situation in which we were unable to actually manage because then we found that uh, APs were actually given to some companies to allow for the imports of plastic waste. And this was really quite devastating because of uh, many of the uh, local councils that were in charge of allowing companies to operate, etc., started to say that they were powerless because the instructions were coming from the federal government to allow these, these companies to operate, including closing an eye to many other illegal operations that were taking place. So it was a very, very important issue to address. So we actually wrote to the European Anti-Fraud Office to lodge a complaint. And we were really glad that the European Anti-Fraud Office had picked up the investigations and then they had uh, issued compounds and summons to some of the European Union factories that were exporting uh, plastic waste into Malaysia. So there was some success here and there on the uh, issue of advocacy to return plastic waste and to uh, 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 remove it from uh, many of the ports in our country. Okay, the next issue is the issue on uh, natural resource governance. And I think this is another very big issue, which is a Southeast Asian uh, cross-border issue, because we find that uh, this region is very rich in natural resources. Uh, for example, in Myanmar, um, there was a report that actually looked at uh, jade extraction, where 90% of the world's jade actually comes from Myanmar. And it was extracted in very perilous situations where, of course, the politi political situation was also weak. And it came from the Kachin state, where many refugees have uh, left the, the situation because of the uh, military presence and the violence that have taken place. Uh, there have been some um, very successful advocacies because of uh, investigative work uh, by journalists and by civil society groups in the Philippines and in Indonesia 
to subscribe to EITI's um, uh, criteria for natural resource governance. But it is a growing problem because uh, it, whether it's about uh, mining, whether it's about coal or jade or uh, gold, etc., it has devastating uh, impact on the environment. And this is something that we probably can find a lot of interesting case studies to look at how investigative journalism can call out the stakeholders and the actors and how people who live on the environment like the Orang Asli communities and the indigenous, indigenous communities are directly impacted because large companies are coming in to our countries from outside to actually reap the profits from the whole uh, area of natural resources. Okay, the next of the uh, issues is the Pandora Papers that uh, uh, has been highlighted a few times already. But I wanted to take some time so that we can understand what, what are the issues that we need to look out for in the Southeast Asian region. And what is it that was so successful about the consortium of investigative journalists that actually looked at so many country leaders, uh, political leaders, as well as business leaders that were caught literally with their pants down on how they had actually first evaded paying tax in their home countries and started to invest in um, secret jurisdictions around shell companies. And a very important other area which is connected so much to transnational crimes and corruption, which is the issue of money laundering. And all of our countries and their leaders have very rich histories. Not all of our leaders, most of our leaders have very rich histories uh, of how they have laundered money because money laundering is uh, simple to understand, but it's very complicated in its exercise, where you place Ill illicit, illicitly obtained funds into um, legal entities. So it gets washed, like in a washing machine, it gets laundered so that it can be reinvested into uh, real estate, into diamond, gems, uh, very high-end type of uh, property so that it cannot ever be traced where the source of the money is coming from. So that is why in the SDG goal 16.4 is on uh, actually trying to stop illicit financial flows from developing countries. Southeast Asia and in particular Malaysia scored really badly because we were number five from the bottom of the list in allowing for capital flight and money to leave the country. So if, if there were laws to track illicit enrichment, which we don't have, uh, this is something that investigative journalists can actually work on in their countries that actually do have that. Like in the Philippines, I understand that you do have a law uh, on illicit, uh, tracking illicit enrichment in, and also in uh, Cambodia under your anti-corruption law. Uh, if, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but from what I have uh, read and uh, talked to friends in these countries, there are some of us that actually have asset declaration laws and tracking illicit enrichment, it would be really, really important to look at uh, what is a legitimate in investment, what is not, who are those that are cheating the system, et cetera. Now there's one more area, which is uh, asset recovery. This is something we learned from the 1MDB scandal and uh, or when there was that monumental change of government in 2018 in our country. I was given the opportunity to sit in the 1MDB investigation committee. And then we realized that out of that, the billions that were stolen and how Najib and his uh, gang of thieves had actually stolen so much of the, of the money that the money laundering was so difficult to trace 
and how then do you recover the assets? Because you don't know what was a legitimate investment, what was a bogus investment, and how do you actually call for, if you remember my first slide on the uh, political security blueprint, it was about mutual legal assistance as well, and how we actually need to get our different legal jurisdictions to also start cooperating together. So there's huge scope to write about this because there's so little understanding about why countries need to solve corruption uh, by looking at legal mechanisms, by looking at following the paper trail and definitely following the money. Okay, I have put the criminal activity again to remind us that when we talk about turning the tide on corruption, we are actually talking about bringing criminals to justice. Corruption is a crime. And many of our countries actually have laws that criminalize corruption. But because of the issue of uh, poor accountable governance, um, uh, corrupt law enforcement, et cetera, uh, oftentimes corruption manifests itself in so many um, complicated layers that it becomes very, very difficult to find evidence, very difficult to actually get uh, the sender and the receiver, for example, to actually speak? And how do you actually get uh, witnesses to testify in corruption trials that they had part partaken in different criminal activity and so on? So for those uh, investigative journalists among you that cover court cases, you'd understand the complexity in actually getting corrupt offenders to speak and to testify unless they get change from um, uh, suspects to become crown witnesses in actually allowing for uh, many different corruption scandals to be resolved at, at the court level. So this is something else for us to actually look at and to discuss. Okay, um, I just have uh, two or three more slides uh, and one other big area that I wanted to highlight is the issue of political financing, money politics, and political parties in Southeast Asia. And one very salient feature in common for political parties that we know whatever country that we're in is that they generate and handle enormous amounts of money and have deep roots and tentacles within the economy and business sector. So this is what I wanted to highlight. Another nexus that is so important for investigative journalists to write about, which is the cross-linking relationship between politics and business and how businesses sometimes because of their enormous influence and resources can actually determine who wins elections, which political parties get funded more than the others, and how they also can hide the sources of their donations. Now in Malaysia, the whole issue of donation, ever since the 1MDB especially, have become a huge issue for definition. What is a donation? And the kind of conduits that are used for donations to be made by business entities, by uh, corporates making donations via foundations, via associations, and via uh, government-linked companies or state-owned enterprises in order to re-channel that money for a political um, event or to actually fund a particular political leader. And this has been something which is been prevalent is not a new problem, but it's just getting so much more complex because political parties are also using secret means of hiding how donations are actually brought into the party. And on some, on some occasions, as we learned in the 1MDB scandal, many of the political party leaders in AMNO, for example, had no idea that the donations were coming from uh, 1MDB money the dirty 1MDB money. And in fact, one of the political leaders was actually charged for not declaring to the income tax the source of where that money was coming from. It, because the money came from the prime minister, he just thought it's money for political activity. So he accepted it without even knowing uh, where the source of the money was coming from. So the Political Financing Act 
will resolve a number of things. One is to actually have an independent contr controller that will be the point person, and it has to be independent, which means there cannot be executive in interference on who this person or, or institution is, to actually uh, record all donations and make transparent which donations is coming from where and for which political party. Now, the other um, advocacy that I feel we need to develop following all these different paper trail is how to look at uh, state funding that uh, I understand Indonesia is already practicing it, uh, state funding for political parties and how through our investigations, we can find if state funding can actually reduce corruption uh, in political parties because money politics and political financing is really the mother of all corruption. It is something that just makes it so difficult to uh, make political parties accountable because political parties need money, political parties need money to run their activities, but the entire problem lies with illicit sources of funding and with uh, political intentions on allowing different types of parties to win different elections. Okay. So this is it. One MDB scandal taught us many things. It was all things grand on corruption. And it wasn't just a Malaysia problem. Of course, it was a Malaysia uh, inspired problem, but it involved other Southeast Asian countries as well. So this is a, uh, an excellent case of why we need to join forces. It involved Singapore. Uh, and as much as uh, uh, we talk about how the Department of Justice in the US uh, had actually led the investigations and all that. Singapore, through its monetary uh, authority in Singapore, had actually started investigations on the banks and the bankers, the merchant banks that were in Singapore, in which the money was laundered via 1MDB. They began the investigation and they jailed some of their bankers first. So this is quite remarkable, really. And I think we need to really look at how we can understand the financial system in the country. Not that I'm praising Singapore or anything. I mean, they're the biggest financial hub for money laundering, et cetera. But these are the kind of things we need to crack. And then we had Thailand, which was um, housing uh, justo the main whistleblower of the 1MDB scandal. And then he was found out and the Thai authorities took action and, and sent him back to uh, Switzerland uh, in, in which he had to uh, go through several issues and all that. And he spent some time in the Thai prisons as well. And then Indonesia for um, seizing the Economiti, the big uh, luxury yacht, and then how the asset was recovered after there was mutual legal cooperation between the Malaysia government after the change of government uh, between Indonesia and Malaysia and how that yacht was brought back and the assets were actually returned. So this is an excellent case of cross-border corruption, an excellent case of why investigative journalists were so critically primary in un uh, uncovering and exposing uh, corruption scandal, without which we would never have had a uh, change of regime. Uh, we would never have had, of course, this current political instability and everything that Malaysia is not very used to in terms of politics. But I wanted to end it here by suggesting a few things on what we can do as journalists in the region. So it was also suggested by Tess just now that we need maybe to do a little bit more uh, research and work on how to develop an investigative journalist network, which I think has so many uh, issues to uncover and has a large scope, um, either through a, uh, an existing alliance or some new initiative, which Kini Academy might want to also explore. And to look at um, how we could also um, collaborate with the Southeast Asia parties against corruption and some of the issues that we wanted to highlight and investigative journalism that will be a central uh, component of how data can be uh, 
released for transnational crimes in Southeast Asia. And then for civil society, how civil society can actually work with the investigative journalists to develop more investigative reporting, uh, evidence-based data, and to push for data transparency. Uh, Data-driven type of uh, advocacy targeting an ASEAN community 2025, so that the promise of an ASEAN integrity dialogue is not just uh, something that they pay lip service to, but would be quite serious to actually take some action. And finally, uh, to assist the governments if they ever wanted to accept the assistance on uh, pushing evidence-based information on what ASEAN needs to change, focus, uh, and develop around the uh, Southeast Asia Pact against corruption. And one of the things I wanted to highlight is the issue of tech technology in turning the tide against corruption, which I think we didn't really touch on earlier, uh, is the use of um, uh, things like blockchain technology, uh, machine reading, artificial intelligence, et cetera, that can help uh, to expose corruption. So blockchain is extremely useful in say uh, procurement systems where you actually get a digitized um, uh, Excel sheets to, tra uh, to track the entire process of how a, a particular project uh, wins a bid and so on and so forth. And to get, of course, technical assistance from um, UNODC, the United Nations Office for, for drugs, and drugs and Crime, mainly to look at government commitments around the Con UN Convention Against Corruption and the UN Transnational Organized Crime Convention, which has three protocols also, all on transnational crime. So one is it is on uh, the flow and smuggling of migrants. The other is on um, weapons. So uh, all these make very critical information. I mean, you may contact us for, for further details because we are actually working on some of these issues quite actively as you figure out your projects and uh, how you actually want to structure your investigative writing. I will be very happy to work with you and Kinney Academy on this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. That sounds very promising. Um, we'll, we, we wish we could have one or two questions, but we need to move to our next speaker. Um, but later, maybe we would pick up your point on potential collaboration between media and civil society. That's something that's that should be very promising. And that's something that's already being done. Like in the US, they've, they've been doing that already with very interesting and promising results. Um, thank you, thank you so much. So our next speaker um, is Dr. Nadirsha Hosen, who has been working as a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law uh, in Monash University uh, since 2015. Prior to this role, Nadir was an associate professor at the School of Law University at the University of uh, Wollongong. And he's also internationally known for his expertise in Sharia and Indonesian law. He's a published author. He's, uh, uh, he's written for internationally recognized and refereed journals and is the author of um, Human Rights, Politics, and Corruption in Indonesia, a Critical Reflection on the Post-Soharto Era. Uh, and constitution, Sharia and Constitutional Reform in Indonesia. He's also co-editor of Islam in Southeast Asia, uh, sorry, and uh, of Law and Religion in, in Public Life. So imagine, um, imagine ASEAN without, um, without corruption. So um, he'll be talking uh, about the I mean, ASEAN without corruption, solutions to corruption, and the way forward in Southeast Asia. Dr. Nadir, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. Right, so. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Corruption in, in, in ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, we, we don't have a magic solution, actually. So 
uh, if you want to uh, listen to me, uh, uh, the solutions uh, for the corruptions that already uh, uh, presented by the corruption issue already presented by the previous speakers, uh, I don't have the, the, the medic solution, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but I think uh, we could identify the issues, you could identify uh, uh, the problems, and at the, at the same time, we could also highlight some efforts that are already uh, conducted by uh, some countries uh, in Southeast Asia. And then hopefully we can, uh, uh, we can have an imagination how ASEAN uh, without corruption at the end. So the main issue is, uh, <clears throat> as has been uh, discussed uh, by the previous speaker, I think uh, there's uh, Nick and Cynthia uh, agree with this, that corruption is principally a symptom of bad governance. Corruption cannot coexist with the rule of law. Uh, but of course then uh, the issue is whether uh, ASEAN members, the 10 ASEAN members uh, have a good governance or not, whether they have the rule of law or not. That's, that's the main uh, uh, issue. And then uh, many scholars uh, looking at uh, corruptions in uh, Asia, they said that this is an endemic, systemic. Other scholars will say that this is uh, systemic and systematic corruption. Uh, and then despite the economic gains, uh, poverty gaps increase. So what went wrong, what went wrong with, uh, with us? And there's also a general recognition that corruption is a problem. So uh, what should we do about uh, this uh, issue? And uh, it's nearly 8 uh, p.m. In, in Melbourne uh, right now. So it's a dinner time for me, actually. So uh, if you see that uh, I'm a little bit slow, uh, then you know why. <laughs> OK, uh, first we look at uh, the, the Corruption Perception uh, Index. Um, so from my slide here, you can see the uh, from 2016, 2017, and uh, 2018, uh, but if we go to the next slide, you can see uh, the last two years, yes, 2019 and 2020. You can see that uh, corruption in, in, in Asia, uh, there are some countries who uh, are really good, like Singapore, that's uh, ranking number three, uh, number four in uh, 2019, and then number three, in, in 2020, so this is really a good achievement. And then we, we can uh, really proud that one of uh, Asian country could reach number uh, three. But if you look at others, uh, there are many uh, different uh, achievement here. So uh, Malaysia uh, dropped from 51 in 2019 to number 57 in 2020. Uh, Indonesia also dropped from uh, number 85 to number 102. Vietnam also drops. Uh, Philippines only uh, two points uh, test. So it's, it's, it's a good one, I think. So, but uh, still is uh, more than 100 here, 113 in 2019 and 115 in 2020. Um, so then from this thing, we can see that the problem here, that there are one country is really good in uh, dealing with anti-corruption. Uh, there are also countries in Asia uh, who are still struggling to deal with uh, corruption issues. So we don't have a magic solution that can be used for all uh, Asian countries. What we can do is we can learn from uh, each other, and hopefully it's like a building blocks, uh, we can develop uh, a better good governance systems. But then uh, there is a, always an excuse whenever we talk about uh, corruption in Asia. They said that there is a culture of corruption. We could not have a solution for corruption in Asia because uh, the culture, uh, allows uh, the practice of corruption. Uh, is it true? That's the big uh, questions. There's a story from uh, Professor Bruce Marco uh, with 
uh, when he traveled to Indonesia. And then uh, he was having a meal with uh, several prominent attorneys. And then the discussion, uh, according to uh, Professor Marco, drifted towards nepotism, which he would classify as a form of corruption. So nepotism is like when you put your family or your friends into uh, several positions uh, without following the procedure, uh, without following the correct procedure. And uh, surprisingly, those attorneys didn't see nepotism uh, that way. It is not part of uh, corruptions. Uh, and then uh, one attorney uh, said that, well, what else is power good for? Right. So this, uh, because it is so difficult to achieve a position. And when you achieve a position, that's because your big family supported you they pray for you, they support for you, even they uh, fund for, for you. So when you reach the position, then you need to return back all uh, the, the prayer or the support by your family. That's why the nepotism is part of the culture. So that's, uh, that's one of the issues. Then people say it is difficult to combat corruption. We don't have a solution because it is embedded in the culture of Asia. Um, some of them uh, also uh, compare how we do business in Asia. So in, in Australia or in, in, in also in other countries, in other Western countries, uh, in order to sign the contract, uh, you can have a one hour meeting. Then at the end of the meeting, uh, you can sign the contract if you're happy or if you can walk away. But if you do business in Asia, you could not do that. Uh, first, there will be a, a conversation, an informal conversation of a coffee. You need to meet the businessman in Asia in, in coffee. And then they will talk about the family. They will talk about your pets. They need to trust you first. So they try to uh, uh, find a chemistry between, uh, between them and you. And then uh, after, then the expectation is that you also tell them about uh, your family, your pet. Then uh, if there's a chemistry, they will invite you to have a dinner, maybe uh, in their house or in the restaurant. If it's a dinner in their house, the expectation is that you will not come in uh, empty hands. You need to bring something uh, as a gift. Again, they don't see this is, this is, part, this is like a bribery. This is like a culture uh, of appreciation. And then during dinner, they will invite you also to bring your partner. They will introduce you to their family. It's like they were coming you to their family. And then once uh, they, they can trust you, and then once they can uh, see that uh, they can get along with you, then they will say, okay, I'm go we are going to meet again tomorrow morning in my office and we are going to sign the contract. Then they're going to shake hands. So it is a long process. This is part of the culture. Uh, and then that's why then some people will say it is impossible to uh, remove corruption entirely in, in, in Asia because the culture is embedded there in, in, in the corruption. Well, uh, I beg to, uh, to disagree. We use culture as a explanation, not as a justification. So this is a different approach. If we use as a justification, and then we say that, well, there is nothing we can do. This is, uh, this is culture. Uh, but if we use as an explanation, then we can say that, well, we can understand where this is coming from, but we could not legalize this practice. And even so, when we talk about the culture, it's a dynamics, right? The culture is a dynamics. Uh, 15, 20 years ago would be different. With, uh, uh, with the current era. So uh, those who said that we could not combat corruption in Asia because of the culture of corruptions, I think uh, they miss to see that the corruption is dynamics. And then actually uh, we could change the culture. Maybe it is not one night, it's not an overnight solution. Uh, it's a long-term uh, uh, solution, but at least uh, if we see that way, then uh, we can change the culture through the education, for instance, through the information and so on and so forth.
Okay, and then another question is if really there is an uh, Asian values of uh, corruption uh, uh, that were to blame, how do we explain then the different levels of corruption in Asian countries? Like I already uh, put on, on my previous slide about the corruption perception index, there's a Pakistan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, and Indonesia. So if, if the argument of culture is right, then surely Singapore will not uh, reach number three. Uh, in the corruption perception index, for instance. So uh, that's why then if we look at the data, uh, the argument about uh, we could not uh, combat corruption because of culture uh, uh, is not justified. How about democracy? I think uh, previous speaker, uh, Professor Nick already uh, touched this. Uh, corruption and democracy, is it true that democracy a powerful tool to reduce corruption? Well, again, if you look at the data, Singapore is not a full democratic country, but successfully can reduce its corruption level. Singapore again rank number three, Australia a democratic country, number 11, even US number 25th. Right? So uh, it means that, well, maybe it's not democracy that we need to reduce the corruption. That's the argument. So what, we, what do we need? We need a strong leadership. That's why Singapore is not a full democratic country, but successfully reduced its corruption level because there's a strong leadership in Singapore. But if we use the same argument, how about North Korea? North Korea is uh, the lowest rank, is number 172 in 2020. And then we know that North, North Korea, they have a strong uh, uh, leader there, but the corruption is really high. So, uh, so then there is a big question here, uh, the relationship between uh, uh, corruption and, and democracy. And another issue is corruption and religion. Does religion matter? Uh, the assumption is that, well, if uh, the country uh, establish uh, their religious law, then uh, the corruption level will drop. Take examples of uh, uh, Islamic countries. Uh, if they uh, cut the hands of the thief, cut the hands of the corrupt people, then the assumptions that the corruption level will be uh, reduced significantly. But the data says that the uh, Arab Saudi, who uh, established a Sharia, in, uh, including uh, Islamic criminal law, Hudud, uh, sit in the position of uh, 52nd. Right, uh, and then uh, Brunei Darussalam uh, sit in the uh, position of 35th. They try to apply the hudud, uh, but they postpone it, Brunei Darussalam. And other countries like uh, United Emirates Arabs uh, reach uh, 21st. Syria, even worse than North Korea, it's 178. Italy and Philippines, uh, they follow uh, Catholics. Uh, but the, uh, they differ in the position, uh, Italy 52nd and Philippines in 115. Brazil also follows Catholic, but uh, they reach also 94. So then uh, we need to, <clears throat> to look at other elements. Uh, religion itself still important, especially in Asia, but we could not uh, use religious argument here to say that, well, unless, uh, you follow religion uh, strictly, then uh, you could not combat corruption. So the data differs on, on this, then we have to be careful uh, to, uh, to follow uh, the arguments about uh, relationship between anti-corruption uh, and, and religion here. Corruption and economy. Uh, some might argue that, well, Singapore is a rich country. Brunei is a rich country. That's why then uh, they, they reach a, a good uh, ranking in corruption perception index. But then uh, <clears throat> Cambodia and Laos, because uh, they are poor Asian countries, then they reach ranking 160 and 134 respectively. Is it true then? There is a, a relationship between corruption and uh, 
than economy here. Well, we have two conflicting situations between corruption and poverty. They unfortunately go hand in hand on one hand, yeah, on one level. Uh, and then uh, where people are forced to bribe to get essential services like health and water, corruption is part of survival kit. So then, yes, there is a, a, a relationship between corruption and poverty. But then uh, there is also a, a, a problem if we only look at the poverty issues here, because uh, there are also uh, international financial institutions like uh, IMF, International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, that uh, puts uh, some money into those uh, uh, poor uh, countries. Right. So uh, if the assumption is that they don't have money, that's why then there's a corruption. Uh, but the other uh, uh, thinking saying, well, if they don't have money, uh, they, then they will not corrupt because they don't have something that they can corrupt. In fact, uh, the poor countries, they get money from foreign aid, but then uh, uh, the government uh, use the money for their own benefit. Then there's a question, why should taxpayers in the richer countries be asked to support the left, the lavish lifestyles of the laptop uh, kleptocrats in corrupt states, right? So why then uh, Australia, uh, UK or US, for instance, uh, give uh, financial aid uh, to Asian countries uh, if they know that uh, some of the money uh, will be uh, used by uh, government for their personal benefits. Right? So again, there's an issue here between corruption and, and economy. And corruption and prosperity here, whether there is relationship between income and corruption, because if that's the case, then uh, why don't we increase the salary of government uh, uh, officer? We increase the salary of judges, we increase the salary of the attorneys, uh, <clears throat> we increase the salary of the police, uh, then there will be no corruptions. Is it right? Is this the solution uh, to increase the salary? Uh, well, it works well in Singapore, but not in Indonesia. Uh, in Singapore, the, 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 salary, the salary of the prime minister uh, is one of the highest salary in the world. Um, uh, but in Indonesia, once you increase the salary, it means that you also increase the amount that you're going to bribe the officer. So if the salary level is only, uh, let's say uh, $3,000, then the money that you need to uh, bribe the officer, it could be around uh, 20% or even 50% of $3,000 of their salary. But then if this, their salary is increase to ten thousand dollars then you only pay uh, one thousand uh, dollar bribery they will refuse it because now they already have ten thousand dollars of their salary that means that you need to pay more for them so the increase of salary will also increase the amount that you need to bribe the officer so again there is no magic solution Okay, uh, how about a uh, penal code? What if we increase the penalties, right? If increasing the salary will not work for all Asian countries, how about if, if we increase the penalties, right? Uh, from higher penalty to capital punishment, for instance, will it work? Well, uh, the problem is that once you increase the penalties, then you also increase the transaction, the negotiations behind the bar. Right? And also, uh, this also could be dangerous, increasing the penalties, because the government can use uh, this higher penalty, let's say capital punishments, to punish their political opposition or political opponents. 
they can have a, a politicization of this uh, uh, anti-corruption uh, effort. Yes. And this could be uh, dangerous. And uh, how about the other uh, uh, proposal of reversal of the burden of proof? So usually in the, in the criminal law, uh, if you get accused of uh, doing corruption, then the government or the attorney or the police uh, needs to provide evidence, right? Because they are the one who charge you uh, with the uh, uh, penalty offenses, right? Uh, but reversal of the burden of proof means that anyone who is or has been maintaining a standard of living, right, uh, which is significantly disproportionate to his present or past non legal income, and who is unable to produce a satisfactory explanation for this could be charged under corruption law. So let's say that your salary is only $3,000 per month, but you have a BMW in your garage and you are a judge. Then uh, using this reversal of the burden of proof, then you could be arrested, you could be charged of corruption unless you can prove that uh, uh, this BMW, you get it uh, from, uh, for instance, from uh, from your parents, right? your parents pass away, and then uh, there's a, uh, uh, you are inherited uh, some of their uh, money. So then use that money, you buy BMW. So this is reversal of the burden of proof. It works well in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, but then when I asked uh, the attorneys in Indonesia, why then in Indonesia they don't have why they don't have this reversal of the burden of proof. And then uh, the answer, one attorney said to me, well, Nadir, have you ever visited our parking uh, space in our uh, uh, attorney general office? I said, uh, yes, why? You could see many luxury car there. You can name it. We have it. And then we will be the first victim if we have reversal of the burden of proof. Because clearly we could not afford those luxury cars using our our salary, so that's why they don't want to uh, to propose this reverse of the burden of proof because they will be the first victim. So despite uh, the fact that this solution uh, works quite well in Hong Kong and Singapore, does not mean that we could easily transfer uh, this model to uh, other countries. Okay, uh, and then uh, why don't we just go to the public then about corruption in order to find the, the, the solutions. Uh, then we need to understand why do people accept the corruptions? Uh, some of the answer is that this is a shortcut to long bureaucracy, right? So uh, uh, we need to, uh, uh, if we want to apply for a, a license uh, from government, for instance, uh, if we follow all the rules, it will take uh, 21 days. And there is no guarantee that at the end of 21 days, we could get the license or the permit. Right? But then if we pay the money, then in three hours, we can get the permit license. So this is a shortcut to long bureaucracy. And, the, and, and, and that's why then there is no choice uh, uh, for for people, uh, except to uh, to co to accept the corruptions, right? they want to accept the corruption because uh, th there is a benefit for them to bribe uh, 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 the officer. Um, another another uh, answer, the other answer is that well, this is uh, a, as business as usual. I mean, um, it has been a, a practice a lot in the last uh, uh, 50, 100 years. Why we want to change it? And as long as it is clear how much that we should pay, whether it is 2% or 5%, percent will be fine. Uh, the businessman uh, will get annoyed uh, if uh, there is no standard office uh, that we, they need to, to pay for the, uh, for, for the officer. And if they, if uh, in one department, they need to pay 2%, 
in the other the other department they need to pay 10 percent then uh, then they say that this is not right but if they know that beforehand that they have to pay two percent more or five percent more then they can they can put this cost as a part of production cost right and then at the end they said that we don't have any problem because then we are going to increase the price of the products or services so their, their own people will pay for this for the corruption that the officer received not us we are a businessman we know how to calculate so we are fine with the corruption <clears throat> so that, that's some of the uh, the perceptions they get from the corrupt uh, for, uh, uh, from the public about uh, uh, corruptions and again with this uh, in mind how we provide a solution there right. so i'll come uh, uh, to that later on so uh, now we need to look at there are three levels of, of corruptions right uh, there's a uh, the stock level mid level and low level uh, then the solution to each level would be different we could not have one magic solution as uh, i already uh, uh, stated many times so with the top level this is what they call it greed corruptions uh, they, they already have a, a good salary they already have a good life right uh, like for instance uh, a chief justice of constitutional court in indonesia uh, arrested of corruption or the the the, the 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 speaker of the parliament they already rich people but why they still uh, receive the money this is what call it due to greed this is greed corruption and with this level the solution will be different mid level we have a systemic corruption it means that if you work in the government it doesn't matter whether uh, uh, you take the money whether you are corrupt or not you are part of the team and the team is corrupt right so this is systemic corruption even if you don't uh, take the money by yourself but then you will get the money uh, because they were going to uh, uh, spread the, the amount and and everyone will be happy right and then they can continue the practice this is what's called systemic corruptions but and then again the solution will be different for the mid level for the low level this is a pity corruption based on need not greed right so uh, because of the salary the salary level of policeman in indonesia is very low for instance then uh, if uh, if you if you're driving and then uh, you break the laws like for instance if you uh, you pass the uh, traffic lights the red light then uh, usually uh, in indonesia it's current practice that uh, you're going to give the money to to the police uh, big, uh, and the police will accept it not because they are greedy but based on the need they they have the the low level uh, 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 salary so with these three different level the solution would also be uh, different so uh, let us uh, look at the solution in each level so for the top level the method is frying the big fish so when there is a culture of engaging in corrupt acts with impunity the only way to begin backing it up is for a number of major corrupt figures to be convicted and punished so uh, for the anti-corruption agencies or for the attorney then they need to target some of the uh, the, the figures in the government whether it is the prime minister the minister uh, or any other uh, top positions uh, to be convicted and punished this will give the message uh, that other uh, minister uh, this will give a message and also a warning so then other minister and other top position will not do the same right so trying the big fish so the greedy people will uh, will will uh, think twice uh, to accept the money because of uh, the warning here but this will only work uh, this uh, solution if there is a political will from the ruling party or the relevant government officials right but as uh, Cynthia explained to us the money politics is the biggest problem so then if they don't uh, have a political will here then certainly this kind of uh, uh, 
a solution will not work. And then we need also to setting up a special anti-corruption commissions. Why we need to have these special anti-corruption commissions that we already have in Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, and also in some other countries? That's because the perceptions that there is a low salary for the police and for the uh, public prosecutor, and uh, they have limited powers. So we uh, set up these special anti-corruption agencies or commissions. Uh, we give them uh, good money, and then we also give them uh, more power. So uh, then they can uh, fly the big fish. So this uh, the, the the strategy at the top level. The, strat the strategy of the mid level, uh, which is a systemic and systematic corruptions, then a good governance. Right. Here we come about the transparency, accountability, rule of law, clear regulation, bureaucratic reform. This is the solution. Right. Uh, <clears throat> if, for instance, we try only uh, to catch the fees here uh, without uh, have without having a bureaucratic reform, transparency, accountability, then uh, in the long term, it will not work at all, the strategy. So the strategy for uh, catching the big fish is on, uh, will work for the top level, for, but for the mid level, we need to have a good governance here. This is really the biggest effort for, uh, for uh, 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 Asian governments uh, to have transparency and accountability in order to uh, deal with systemic and systematic corruption. So this is the solution for the mid-level. And the solution for the uh, low level, the petty corruption, is increasing the salary, especially for police, judges, uh, uh, Department of Public Prosecutor, DPP, tax officer, teachers, and, and other things, uh, and so on. So, uh, so you see that uh, there are different uh, solutions here, uh, depends on, on the level. Right now, some of the uh, case studies uh, that you can have here um, uh, in Thailand, and I think uh, Nick already mentioned about this. In Thailand, uh, they have many independent organizations: uh, the National Anti-Corruption Commission, the Election Commission, the Office of the Ombudsman, the Human Rights Commission, and others, and also the other non-state parties. But what went wrong with the system? Why has corruption? not lesson, despite the fact that they already have these uh, agencies. So uh, many different agencies, and they have uncoordinated work. So it makes them less efficient. Uh, it's like uh, what Nick already said to us, uh, if there are many too many uh, rules, too many regulations, it's confusing. And then uh, sometimes there is no clear rules about that. Uh, and even conflicting rules, uh, the same uh, happened with uh, uh, many uh, agencies here. If too many different agencies dealing with corruption, then there will be an uncoordinated work and uh, uh, less uh, uh, efficiency. Okay, so I already have uh, uh, three minutes, so three minutes left, I'm sorry. So, uh, and the agencies do not start out with a clean slate, uh, in flexible rules, political interference, uh, and no strong, proactive, and continuous political support. Um, so there is also, uh, this is enemies anti-corruption courts. Uh, so I will not touch it because I don't have uh, 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 time for this. OK, so uh, this is the conclusions. Uh, we did, uh, to, uh, corruption needs to be dealt with in a holistic manner. Uh, good laws, good, strong, and fair judicial system. Uh, and so on and so forth here. But then back to the questions about the Asian and corruption itself. Right. Uh, I'll give you the link here uh, about the uh, uh, Asian PAC. So this uh, <clears throat> Asian PAC uh, is, is a, uh, and the, the agencies, uh, anti-corruption agencies in some Asian members already uh, signed the agreement to have a collaboration. Right. Then you can check the website there. Uh, I think Cynthia already uh, also mentions about the uh, ASEAN uh, members have ratified the UN Convention Against Corruption and uh, talking about the political security community blueprint. I can also add about Asian economic community. Uh, but 
uh, so this is like a single market, like an EU. Uh, Euro designed it in at the end of 2015, but at, up until now we don't see much about this uh, AEC, and their focus is more on the uh, economic. Um, and uh, my last slide here's uh, why we don't have a magic solution for the Asians because uh, in Asian members, the ten Asian members, they have a different legal systems, they have different languages, they have different economic achievements, the uh, different cultures and religions. Some of them even consider like a safe haven. So despite the fact that Singapore is, uh, is one of the uh, top three uh, uh, countries in dealing with corruptions, but uh, many uh, corrupt uh, uh, people in Indonesia think Singapore is a safe haven because there is no extraditions. Once uh, they corrupt uh, Indonesia, then they can run away and then live in Singapore and uh, the police, uh, innocent police cannot touch them. And for the AEC, uh, as an uh, uh, Asian economic community, there is no law enforcement because they really focus on the economy. So uh, uh, I finished my uh, presentation. Uh, hopefully we can have a discussion. Thank you very much, Tess and others. Thank you, Dr. Nadir. You've given us some very thought-provoking questions, among others, that I think we need to be pondering in as journalists, those of us in the media, in part to help us, uh, I mean, Pondering those questions could help inform, among others, how we frame, for example, the stories on corruption that we that we write or produce. Um, I understand we have a question, Adib. Uh, before yeah. we move into, we have very little time left. We need to move to uh, our Q and A, our panel discussion now. But go ahead, Adib, please. So would you like me to read out the question, Tess? Yeah, please, go ahead. All right. So, uh, Dr. Nade, you talked about how culture is used to explain corruption. Uh, oh, sorry, no, not, not, sorry, I think I said the wrong one. That was for Dr. Um, that was for Dr. Torpless. Give me one moment. Okay, there's another question for Dr. Nade specifically. Um, in the 80s and 90s, we saw massive protests against corrupt rulers in Indonesia. Philippines and Malaysia. What role do movements such as Reformasi play in solving corruption? In other words, how do social movements, grassroots movements, how can that be a solution for ending corruption in ASEAN? Uh, yes, that social movement is really important uh, to gain the momentum. And then once you get the momentum, uh, then, uh, then people could propose uh, to make an amendment to anti-corruption laws, and also to find the big fish uh, to follow that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, method. Uh, but you could not stop there, right? Uh, that's what happened uh, uh, in, in those countries that, uh, uh, that you asked. Uh, the, <coughs> efforts, uh, the efforts to combat corruptions after several years, then they lost the moment, momentum again, right? Then, it, then everything back to uh, business as usual. So then the question is for the activists, how to keep the momentum, right? And, and sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, uh, like for instance, in, in Indonesia, uh, uh, after the 2019 uh, presidential elections, uh, President Jokowi uh, gained the momentum uh, to run the country for the second term, but then uh, his government amended the 2002 uh, Kepika uh, law, uh, uh, Anti-Corruption Commission law, which reduced uh, the power of KPK. So, so this is the, the problem. Instead of trying to strengthen, uh, because uh, he he just won the elections, people supported him, right? Uh, but he uh, uh, reduced uh, the power of uh, anti-corruption commissions. And at the time, there was uh, uh, another massive demonstrations, right? But uh, uh, it lost the momentum right? because we just finished the election and people fought it for the second time. So that's why then uh, uh, we need to uh, keep the momentum. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Tess, did you want to move on to um, you, the Q&A session? Yeah, you have another question here. Is that for Dr. Nadir also? You talk uh, about- That is for Dr. Torplus. Would you like me to read the question? So yeah, would yeah, you prefer... please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so this question is for Dr. I'll just spin myself as well. Um, 
So for Dr. Torkles, you talked about how culture is used to explain corruption. Um, are there any aspects of traditional Southeast Asian culture that can reduce corruption? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think Dr. Nadia has, um, has uh, covered I think, this issue. Yes. I think yeah, that was Dr. Uh, Nadia, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Would, would you like to respond to this? Yes, uh, so uh, yes, uh, our approach is that uh, we don't use culture as a justification. We use culture as an explanation. Then, if the then the question whether there is also an element in the culture uh, uh, that we can use to justify the anti-corruption uh, uh, effort, right? Uh, well, in in Asia, uh, there's also a culture of uh, shaming, right? So then, once your family got arrested, uh, it will bring a shame to the, to the whole family. Right? Then we can use that uh, in order to combat the corruption. Right? The problem is that, of course, then in, 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 uh, uh, in the cities, in the metropolitan cities, no longer we have such a bond in a big family. We become individualists, more and more individualists. Right? So then, uh, then even uh, uh, this uh, culture is like a direct uh, a contradictions with the with the with another uh, 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 traditions of supporting uh, your family. Right? <coughs> when you reach the top position, we need to support you, right? But once uh, you are declared as a corrupt, you are arrested, then the family said that well, we still need to support. Uh, this guy, right? Because uh, we already get some, uh, so much money, so much. Vision. So, what's the law should, uh, should do? Then there is some suggestions. We could post the picture of the corrupt so, uh, in the media. Uh, then this is like a shaming. Even in social media, you could put them. Then at least then the family. Uh, will will feel that well this this bring this guy bring the, the shame to, to, to our family, uh, but there's of course then there's there's another issue about the human rights, right? So so then we need to to be careful uh, if one if we want to uh, use this uh, method, but my point is that uh, I don't believe that uh, the culture in in, in Asia uh, accommodates uh, corruptions uh, like that. Uh, I think I think those who use uh, corruption issues, uh, cultural issues, is like uh, it's like a garbage bin, because because they could not uh, provide any other solutions, right? Uh, then they said that well, this is a culture. Uh, so e so again, easy explanation. Uh, easy explanation, yes, mm -hmm. uh, right. And then then and then and and uh, sadly to say, some of uh, People outside Asia, like from uh, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, uh, some of them also subscribe to these uh, ideas. Right? They said that what, whatever you do in Asia, you could not remove corruption because that's a culture. Right? Is it and one of those, sorry, Dr. Nadir, yeah. is it one of those sure. narratives that need to be debunked by the media if we are to write about corruption the way we should and in a manner that will help address the issue of corruption in the region, in, 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 in our respective countries at the very least. And do you think agree. other narratives that need to be debunked as well when it comes to covering corruption? Okay, could you expound on this a bit more? Yeah. yeah I agree. Yeah. May, may other, I add? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Sorry. go ahead. Oh, just a little bit to this. But I happen to uh, got to read the new article by Professor Bo Rostein of the Gothenburg University. Uh, he mentioned about this as well, and, and, and similar to what Dr. Nadia has just mentioned, that this is just like a, a, an easy way out for explaining why corruption is still, still prevail in, in different countries, especially in ASEAN and Asia's country. Um, and he, he suggested that there's a, there are lots, actually there are lots of surveys which actually ask people how they think about corruption. And 90% of the, of the people who answer these surveys suggested that they hate corruption and they think that corruption is devastated to, to the country. But the way that factors, the structure, the political structure, the social political structure in, in, in many countries just facilitates 
uh, this he called and put uh, standard pro standard operating procedures of the countries, which means this standard proceeding uh, standard operating procedures, which allow us to which um, actually provoke us to tend to corrupt, actually uh, is the on may 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 be on the contract may um, what what should I say may contradict our our thoughts and ethics and and, and 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 culture. So it's not the culture that that would that could be the the answer to why our anti-corruption fails or corruption prevails, but because of other factors of structural factors as well. Yeah. And, and not subscribing to that thinking would have a lot of impact, I think, on how we would cover corruption uh, we we in the media uh okay there's another question here the weakening of corruption eradication has occurred in the last two years in indonesia with the amendment of the yeah as mentioned by uh, dr nadir earlier the election of people who have violated ethics to become leader of the organization and the dismissal of investigators with integrity through a system of staffing status transfers known as the nationalist insight test or the TWK. My question is, does the same thing happen in other ASEAN countries and how journalists across the region can collaborate in order to tackle this issue? Anyone of our speakers could address this question. So just to, to, uh, to give the, the background of that question and things, there's a TWK that uh, he or she mentions. Uh, it's about civic knowledge test. So uh, in the last two years, Indonesia was dealing with uh, uh, radicalism and extremism uh, and, and politicization of uh, religion. But then the government uh, uh, smartly used this uh, narrative. They said that there is a Taliban in KPK, in the, uh, the anti-corruption agencies, and then uh, then when uh, the uh, Jokowi administration amended uh, the law that uh, they said that now uh, the independent members of uh, uh, KPK should become uh, the government official. And then they need to pass the test, what they call a civic knowledge test. And then uh, around uh, 57 uh, didn't pass the test because uh, they're not nationalist enough and they're part of this Taliban, they're radical, right? Uh, so they used this idea of religion in order to remove the efforts of anti-corruption commission. And this is really ridiculous because some of these uh, members of uh, uh, the, the 57, uh, the, sorry, 50, yeah, 57 that didn't pass the civic knowledge test, uh, they are not Muslims. Uh, so, they, uh, so no way they will be subscribed to the idea of Taliban, right, uh, of extremism. But again, successfully uh, with the support of uh, people in Indonesia, uh, using this narrative, uh, then uh, the government uh, reduced the capacity of KPK. So then whether this also happened in other uh, regions other countries, I don't know. So maybe some of you can explain. Yeah. To be sure, there are similar efforts elsewhere in Southeast Asia, including the Philippines, to weaken institutions that otherwise have an important role to play in, in addressing corruption. There's one question here addressed to Cynthia. Suspected corruptors from my country sometimes hide in other ASEAN countries to avoid legal proceedings. How should ASEAN take a role to deal with issues like this? Thank you for that question. Uh, before I answer that question, I just wanted to say something about the law enforcement. The, the question earlier that Dr. Nadir was answering. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, we have always looked up to Kapika Indonesia as a good example of what an anti-corruption commission should be and should actually do that. Uh, even politicians and judges fear the anti-corruption commission. It was that independent before the law got amended. And I, I think this is where I, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with the discussions around culture, because for me, the issue is about power. Uh, corruption is about power, and it is not something which is uh, cultural. It becomes cultural when power allows it to permeate into society for the benefit of uh, quid pro quo for, for the benefit of a status quo of the situation. So 
um, what happened? What is happening to our Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission now? I think it's really quite a crisis because we find that officials in the commission are stealing the money that they had seized as part of the stolen assets. So now they've become thieves themselves uh, because it's so tempting to actually look at all the loot that was stolen over the, the entire 1MDB cause, et cetera. So uh, there's no more trust that you can place on a commission. So how do you deal with, with um, addressing power to ensure that um, a downgrade, like what happened to Kapika, I call it a downgrade because it was such an independent institution before, uh, <clears throat> will not happen to other institutions. Um, so what is it that civil society journalists and people can do? I think it's a very, very important question to answer that it should be in election pledges. It should be something codified or something that's written that we can hold governments to ensure that uh, bills or parliaments will not be passed to uh, allow for greater executive interference and and all that. So it's a power question. So in relation to that, uh, this, this question to me that I wanted to answer is also linked because it's about um, how uh, corrupted uh, offenders are actually allowed to avoid legal proceedings and to hide in some countries. So even in our story of the 1MDB, we are still unable to track the main culprits uh, who stole all that loot. Um, and we hear that it's actually China that, um, um, that, that's hiding uh, Joe Lo and that's hiding um, the criminal in exchange for um, economic benefits that they can have in the country. Uh, so it's a win-win situation for both. But for ASEAN, uh, there needs to be developed more established like extradition treaties. How do you actually get a particular corrupt offender hiding, say, in, uh, in Laos or in Myanmar or in Cambodia when they actually need to be brought to Malaysia or Singapore or Philippines to be tried in court, etc.? There's no... Uh, systemic process that I'm aware of that will allow these things to happen. So this is where it's really important to develop that kind of a cohesive um, narrative to be built up that this is what ASEAN needs to do uh, in the context of 2025 and what the political security blueprint needs to mean for the ASEAN people because it it is a national security issue. And one more line on national security, that if any of us are following what's happening in the US, it's quite interesting how Biden's administration has actually now defined corruption as a national security issue. Uh, and whether that is something ASEAN needs to also uh, evolve in that direction, that it actually jeopardizes the security of nations if we allow corrupt uh, leaders to just be left uh, without any kind of uh, accountability mechanism placed on them. So these are very important questions to answer, but just a quick answer is there's no uh, structure at the moment to actually allow those hiding outside the country to be brought back. Yeah, the, just a quick follow up. This might sound cynical, but should we even be looking to ASEAN, the regional bloc, for you know for measures to address corruption in the issue? Given how weak, uh, at least that's the widespread perception of of ASEAN, the regional bloc, not the region. Yeah, would you like to address that? Yeah, Cynthia. No, I I, I was hoping you would react to that. Yeah, sorry, Cynthia. Yeah. Uh, is there another question? No, no, no um, Tess was asking the question about, about uh, Tess, did you want to repeat? Yeah, no, I said, should we even be looking to ASEAN, the regional bloc, oh. uh, on matters like this, given how weak, you know, uh, ASEAN is? Again, the regional bloc, not the region, yeah. Um, I, I actually think the strategy should be two-pronged. Uh, one is, to develop strength among ourselves, uh, knowing that the regional bloc is weak, 
but uh, sometimes they can surprise us, like what's happening with the uh, summit and how they have left Myanmar out. It's quite shocking that a weak association would actually take that kind of action. Uh, but it was also because uh, there's enough pressure to ensure that a decision like that could be taken. So I, I, I just think that as we strengthen our own discourse and our own narrative, then it becomes stronger when we want to um, engage with the ASEAN Secretariat or the ASEAN Foundation, etc. But at the same time, I also think that within ASEAN as a, as a block of governments would be the hardest to penetrate. There are many other sectors in ASEAN that we might need to engage to be stakeholders that can um, that can join us in the fight against corruption. And one of it could be um, uh, the legal networks, the academic networks, uh, and also um, the corporate sector, which in uh, many of our eyes are also the, the crooks because they're usually the givers of the bribes, the, the ones that facilitate and enable a particular corruption to happen. Sometimes it could also be because that's just how it is. That's just, in one of my slides, I talked about the cost of doing business, that you have to uh, ensure a certain portion of money is actually given out for corruption, for uh, gift giving, for bribes, et cetera. And whether uh, turning the tide against corruption would also, would also mean uh, gaining uh, support from other stakeholders before we deal with the governments, which are the most difficult. Thank you, uh, Cynthia. There's a question here from Danny addressed to me. Um, is there any journalism collaborative that focuses on corruption in ASEAN? Um, honestly, I don't know of any, but maybe any one of the participants uh, Sorry to single out Carmela, Carmela of PCIJ. I know she's here. Uh, would you know of any? I, I'm not aware. Uh, focusing on ASEAN. I suppose Danny meant ASEAN the block. Or maybe the, the region as well. Anyone? Um, anyway, you could type it into the it's chat. An organization. I'm not, um, I'm not sure. I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Carmela. Oh, I think this presents an opportunity. <laughs> this is something to explore. <laughs> Kini Academy, for example, might want to yeah, consider this. But yeah, I, I, I've written uh, stories on ASEAN, including on migrant labor. And my sense was there's, there's much to look into where how it functions is concerned. So and that's my strong sense at the time. As I, I, I wrote some stories on, 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 on issues surrounding the, the, the region. Just to government. follow up and to yeah. understand uh, whether journalists would be motivated to set up a, a, not, not a whole institute or structure, but a, like an alliance uh, to do more writing for yeah. the region, investigative type of writing for the region. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it can be quite, um, uh, you know, not so motivating to look at ASEAN as a block, uh, because then we get into all these non-interference issues and stuff, but about uh, calling out um, corruption uh, through what I was trying to uh, espouse just now about uh, transnational crimes, uh, cross-border corruption issues, etc. There can be more narratives written around that. Right. That kind of alliance would be so powerful. Yeah, yeah. That, that's quite exciting to hear, actually. And you've given us very good leads for potential stories, actually. I, was, I, I wanted to say that. Uh, there was a question here from Cherry Salazar of PCIJ. She asked this er earlier. Digital tech has made publishing and content creation more accessible. Anyone can now post their own articles and videos online. With social media essentially programmed to be like echo chambers, Legitimate media is struggling to preserve public trust. How can we strengthen and maintain that trust and integrity in this age of disinformation? Even if our stories are groundbreaking, it won't affect policy so much if it's easily dismissed by propagandists, if public doubts 
our integrity as churnos. So this is addressed to me. Um, I'm I'm a firm believer, and this might sound very um, uh, how would I call it? I'm a firm believer in the power of stories. When I was doing, when I was actively writing as as an investigative uh, journalist. I, I posed this question to myself, what impact would my story have given the amount of work I, 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 I did, the risks I took to be able to put out these stories. Um, but I figured maybe the impact is not immediate, but it's, you know, it's just, it's one story at a time and taking things one step at a time in, in our effort to, again, I go back to what I said earlier about raising the level of discourse. If only, you know, X number of people, readers get to understand the, situ the situation at hand, maybe along the way, more people will, will understand. So I, I, I try to maintain that, that mindset in the course of my, my journalistic work. Um, yeah, this is it's it's far more difficult nowadays, I think, to be putting out investigative stories because we're up against all these challenges, including disinformation, of course, the trolls, you know, uh, being deployed no less by 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 the government. But imagine a world, or imagine our individual countries without these kinds of stories coming out. You know, people remaining clueless as to what's happening. So that's. Um, that's a huge price to pay, I think. Uh, the public not understanding at all what's going on. So, um, yeah, stories can easily be, can, as, as Cherry puts it, can easily be dismissed by propagandists. But readers, I, I believe, would still be able to distinguish a good story, a well-researched story from one that's, you know, that's really uh, just quote unquote, fake news. Out there are still discerning readers and we need to cater to them. And because, uh, and they're looking for those kinds of stories and we need to be able to, you know, to fill that gap where, where our public needs for, for well-written, well-researched, carefully put together stories um, is concerned. So that's how I would respond to. Any other, may, maybe from the perspectives of our, our speakers, uh, Nadir, Nick, Cynthia, any thoughts? Uh, yes, I think uh, because we live in a digital era, so then we need to uh, uh, combine between, between the stories published uh, by the journalists uh, in the published media uh, with a posting in the social media. Uh, but there is also another, another issue, I think, which is that uh, it's easy to, to access and, and publish any stories through social media right now. Whereas if we want to have a quality uh, uh, investigative uh, report from a journalist, uh, then usually it is not cheap and then, and then the readers need to pay to access uh, from, the, from the website of the, the media. Uh, and, and so this is a problem, right? Uh, there's a, such a good report from uh, Tempo. I, I see that some of Tempo uh, magazines, uh, journalists, or Koran Tempo here. There is a, some good investigated report from uh, Koran Tempo or, or Majala Tempo. But because uh, we need to, to pay the subscription, then not many people can read it. And then people will only read some rumors or some gossip or the propagandists uh, in, in the social media. That's another issue. Uh, that no one will read your report uh, if uh, they they have to pay. So there's there's a good there should be a, a balance uh, approach uh, here uh, at the media. But at the same times, uh, how how can uh, the the media uh, survive uh, with this uh, under this uh, digital era? Right? If there is no subscription, so that's another issue. Uh, I don't know what uh, what you're thinking about that test. Yeah. Um, the other way of looking at it is there are readers willing to pay for good stories. That's why there are some media outlets that still have subscription base. So uh, I think we need to revisit our notion about our readers that they're just after free stories, you know, because there are readers. I think new narrative. I'm I'm a subscriber to new narrative. I I I mean this is my second year uh, with my annual subscription. Meaning to say. 
there are still segments of readers, I think, that are willing to pay for good stories. But we also need, in term, in ter, need to think in terms of how to make our stories more accessible. And while trying to generate more revenue streams, for example, get, getting creative about it so that we will be able to sustain our operations as media and continue to provide our readers, our audience with good stories. Any thoughts from Nick and from Cynthia, maybe from uh, civil society and academic perspective? And then we'll uh, move Actually, to um, the final portion. I, I, I think it needs to uh, be exciting. So it does not, it should not be daunting that, oh, we just like, oh my God, what, what, do, what do we do? But it could start uh, giving Danny more ideas and work, but it could start like what Kenny Academy is doing now is uh, to, to develop more programs like this, where we generate more content because Part of what I understand from all my engagements with journalists is a lack of investigative flavor, at least for Malaysian journalists. So they're good at writing stories based on what happened in the news today and to capture just that. So the whole um, uh, capacity building that's required to probe deeper, to, to follow the paper trail, follow the money, et cetera, requires a lot more time and energy, which also needs resources. Mm -hmm. So uh, those things need to be established in order for us to map some issues that we might want to take on in a pilot project for say six months, that we want to develop 20 stories that are cross-border, that are not specific to one country alone. And then that can be built so that we can share it on all the, uh, the different media that was uh, shared just now, like uh, Rappler, Malaysia Kini, uh, different uh, 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 new narrative and all that, that, that can actually start hosting these stories. And then we can have a, a, a portal, uh, anti-corruption blogs, et cetera, just to build some interest that, uh, that these issues are, are real because I think we need to step up the plate because the criminals are stepping yeah. up their plate. Right. So we need to defeat the narrative that they are using to counter it with, um, you know, different narratives to fight corruption. So uh, the, the title of this event is great because it's called Turning the Tide, but Turning the Tide requ requires a whole initiative. So I would just suggest uh, that we like have like a pilot thing that if we can find resources to do a 20 or 30 stories thing over six months, yeah. and park it maybe at Kenya Academy or some um, entity that's willing to actually expand it beyond this. Because corruption is not just about corruption, it actually links to the rule of law, to yeah. democratic human rights. Yeah. That's right, human rights and everything. So it can actually uh, encompass many issues. And I think climate change is like a huge area that right. has many intersections with corruption. So there's many things that we can, we can map. But in order to do all that, I think the resources and the time, et cetera, needs to be established that it's a project and it can continue. Thank you. Uh, we would like to hear from Nick as well. Um, there's a note here. Please uh, briefly mention your point on corrupt ghosts, quote unquote. Uh, you can, uh, and then maybe explain how journalists can include this information in their narratives. Yeah, could you address that also, Nick? Yeah, please. Um, the, 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 you mean the ghost that I didn't, that, that I didn't. Corrupt ghosts. Uh, yeah. That I didn't get a chance to present. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll go oh, very <laughs> briefly, very briefly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, within two or three minutes. Yeah. Um, so basically, just to address the, the first question first, uh, that is a very, very difficult question. So I think like the, the, the biggest in, uh, investigative journalist uh, agencies in Thailand is still struggling with that. Um, how, how, to, how to be sustained, how to live in this era of uh, social media, etc. But, but my... Um, my, my suggestion from the, from the evidence that I have seen is to try to create a participatory platform with, with, uh, with the people 
more. For example, in the case that I show, uh, uh, when people feel that their voice can be heard and their voice matters, for example, they can just take a picture of this light pole and they can send it to one of the, one of the news agencies. And then, and then the news agencies investigate this case and then it became a, a big story in the country. They feel that, oh, th this is not done or found by a very famous journalist, uh, journalist but just found by, by a, uh, just a person who knows what name. And then it, it, it creates change. And then by doing this, uh, people will feel that, that, that news agencies, like, like investigative journalists matters. And, and as, a, as an evidence, the, the page that I, that I am in relationship with, for example, the must share page, which, uh, which, was, which got this picture from, the, from this, uh, an ordinary citizen, got like a 10,000 more like in a day. So, so if we transfer and transfer, uh, translate that in, in, into uh, um, monetary uh, compensation, that's, that's very sig highly significant can for, for um, a news agency. So, but I, don't, I do not really know if this can be generalized into, into a bigger picture, but to kind of like create an in, interactive interaction with normal citizens would, would, would be part of the answer, I guess. Um, uh, so, but, but you answer this uh, question, so all of you answer this question better than me. Um, uh, and back back to the ghost a little bit. <laughs> That's the part that I didn't get the chance because I got the, the thir my thirty minutes already. But I, I just want to explain that uh, currently, like economics has reached to a point that we are unable to explain many of the questions. So a new, relatively new approach of a behavioral exper exper experimental economics has uh, emerged. And they have been trying to explain cheating or corrupt uh, activities as well. They do not believe that neoclassical economics like cause and benefit will explain everything. They try to understand why people behavior uh, differs uh, in different si situation circumstance. So for example, we found that many of Thai politicians like to go to temples and make donations. And apparently those uh, politicians are, uh, to go to the temple are those who just co commit corrupt crimes. Uh, we we, do, we um, look at their uh, asset disclosure. So it is highly correlated with, with the number, with the, with the, uh, amount of money they donated to the temple. So that's kind of like, we call it moral licensing. Uh, so it's, uh, <laughs> so we, we compare it with non-ghosts who were like, uh, like, like going to temples and make donations while uh, before that they commit corruption crimes that they do the, the donate to feel, make them feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, or there are many other kind of activities. So, it, so, um, so in order to fight these kind of behavior, uh, counter, not fight, to counter these kind of behavior, we need to uh, come up with other solutions rather than just uh, uh, higher democracy, uh, more laws and regulations and so on and so forth, by just by trying to nudge their behavior. For example, in, in, in one experiment, they put um, a wording from the Bible in, before p politicians declare assets. And it apparently when they see something like that and they sign that they were disclosed uh, with truthful information, before writing the information, they, will, they tend to be more truth, truthful to, to the information. Uh, so something as small as this could create big change. But again, this is a very small case. It may not be able to, I may not be able to generalize this into a bigger picture, but, but it just opened up a new uh, perspective to new solutions, to new perspective, new approach to tackle the problem. So yeah. maybe of interest to, to um, journalists who are interested in new approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our speakers. Nick, Nadir, and Cynthia. I've
personally been, you know, I've benefited fa- from just listening to the discussions, the thoughts you shared. Uh, the challenge for us journalists is maybe, you know, uh, revisit our notion of corruption and how we frame corruptions, the, the narratives that we, that we propagate maybe directly or indirectly through our stories. Um, but I want to highlight on a final note before we move on to, um, to, to Danny for the final remarks. Um, I hope that this is just the beginning of a conversation around the potential for collaboration. It's high time that we in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, uh, join forces and uh, explored maybe more creative solutions to what uh, to what's confronting us in the area of corruption. Certainly, as uh, Cynthia has highlighted earlier, there's still a lot of room to explore in terms of stories to, to write, to put out. Um, and, as, and in the meantime, corruption continues to evolve. So we need to be, we need to be acting fast soon enough. Uh, I think the momentum is there and we need to be able to um, move forward, hopefully more constructively, um, if only to address what we've focused on during this day's discussion. So thank you. Thank you everyone on behalf of Kini Academy and thank you to all our participants. Now I turn to, Adi, should I the, turn over the virtual floor to Danny? Yes, for the final yes, remarks? you should. Thank you. Please go ahead, Danny. Yeah, uh, thank you, everybody. What a great discussion, wasn't it? Uh, so I'm heeding, uh, heeding the call from Cynthia and uh, Tess. Um, uh, there are things we can do together. And uh, I thank you, Cynthia, for uh, encouraging all the journalists to uh, collaborate and talk to each other. Uh, this is really very much for them. And uh, we do hope that um, we make it a habit, you know, to uh, to uh, to just reach across if there's uh, something that's happening cross border that is, uh, you know, that we can reach out to our colleagues. The WhatsApp group has been set up, and uh, most of you are already in there, and that's supposed to facilitate that. Uh, that. So um, I've already just got a I've already just got a Cynthia's number to uh, talk to her and probably you know your brains a bit and uh Tess I've also asked you for your number and uh you know maybe uh, one of these days um we can talk some more but uh you know this is not the end uh this we uh I will be um talking to uh the funders and um may we may have we have some ideas for more master classes coming up uh and uh all to do with uh ASEAN and ASEAN related topics so as I mentioned earlier, the recording is available. Uh, it's, you can go to c4.org in a few days. You will see the, the video first, the recording of the whole session, and then you see the transcription and the, um, and the slides as well. Okay, so uh, thank you everybody. Thank you speakers for, uh, what a, great, uh, for a great session. And uh, I'll, good luck and um, I look forward to all your stories. Bye everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Denny. Thank you, Adip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Nick, Tess, and others. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Hey, bye. Nice to meet you all. Nice right. to meet now you. Now I can have dinner. Bye. Thank you. Yes, you can. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Nadir. <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. Bye. So I'll, I'll close this, this meeting room, and we'll see you another time. Bye. Bye.